Now, what do you got? I think I can prove to a judge that both of these men had the men's rear. <gasps> what the hell is the men's rear? It's a uh, legal term the lawyers use. It just means the intention to commit a crime. Okay, come on, let's go. Men's rear. Put the cuffs on him. How could we have gotten men's rear? We take blood? Can you do it without taking blood? Oh, we, we both use condoms. How is this possible? Oh, I want to see a doctor. Oh. Can I have an independent blood test? Hey, money. I feel sick. What are you doing? Men's rear. Oh. 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 My God. Uh, everything that guy just says is bullshit. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whoever you're with, whatever you're doing, however good it feels and however many times you plan on doing it with that person and why you're even doing it in the first place. I don't care. I'm just glad you're doing it right here with me. Legal Vices on my channel, Legal Vices. That's us. It's a Friday chill stream, but we're doing a Friday chill stream with an important topic. We're talking about Clarence Darrow, one of, if not the greatest lawyer in American and if not American, the world history an amazing orator. We're going to be talking about why we're doing this and all of this other stuff as we get into it. Uh, some of you are pointing out, uh, I saw some, I saw some, I saw some things here in chat. You were talking about, uh, uh, people saying late and unprepared. You are absolutely correct. Uh, you've been watching other streams. I've been on Lincoln Kane's stream. We, we hung out with Lincoln for uh, an hour, hour and a half earlier today. And Lincoln Kane, as you will see right here, mods, you need to start dropping some links hardcore for uh, Lincoln Kane's channel, LC, over there on the, on YouTube. Please, please, mods, drop some Lincoln Kane chats here. Lincoln Kane dropping the 50 memberships. If you are one of the amazing people that received one of the 50 Lincoln Kane gifted memberships. You are out of your mind with awesomeness. Lincoln Kane deserves all of the credit, all of the accolades. A man, he's a mensch, he's a gentleman. He'll be a man before his mother. He's an awesome guy. Lincoln Kane, right here in chat. Go over and check out his stream. Check out his channel. Lincoln Kane, LC. The link is right there. Rose just posted it up. Keep posting this link uh, for, for Lincoln Kane. Rose, Rose has done it twice already. She needs to keep doing it. Lincoln Kane for the win. Go over to check out Lincoln Kane's channel. Uh, for those of you that don't know who Lincoln Kane is, he's an awesome guy. Great, super, super, super awesome guy. We had a great chat uh, for about an hour and a half a little while ago. And um, for those of you that are familiar with my F It Friday streams, it's it's F It Friday 24-7 over on Lincoln Kane's channel. It's great, 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 great man. After I finished with Lincoln Kane, I was hanging out over on Meme Copy, and we were having a bunch of fun for like an hour and a half over there as well uh, to the point where I just kind of didn't have time to prepare everything I needed to prepare for my stream. So we're doing a controlled wing it event tonight. I had everything prepared two nights ago during the great orator, the great orator lawyer stream that I did that YouTube struck me for. They struck it and nuked the stream. They took it completely down. I got a huge warning out of them. Uh, and if it happens again, I'm going to be suspended from streaming for a week. So I'm being a little extra careful tonight. A little extra careful. We want to make sure we that doesn't happen again and we don't get uh, yeeted for a week. Because uh, that would suck. <laughs> so we're going to be doing... Uh, the last part of that, we got through most of Jerry Spence, but I'm, I'm afraid of Jerry Spence because of what TED Talks did. TED Talks, TED Talks gave us a massive copyright strike, so mm, to you. Uh, we're going to be talking about Clarence Darrow tonight. Clarence Darrow is the OG lawyer. He's the OG defense lawyer. He is the defense lawyer by which all other defense lawyers are measured. Clarence Darrow is a master of the masters of the craft fighting for the little guy fighting for the fighting for the downtrodden fighting for the oppressed fighting for the workers fighting for the simple man fighting for the fighting for the underdog that's him and we're going to get into a little bit of why who he was what he's done and why he is that OG guy uh, but before we do that we've got a couple of things to do we, first of all we got to get the cocktail of the day out now this is going to seem really simple to people but there's a surprising number of people that can't seem to figure out how to make this basic two-ingredient cocktail. For me, though, I, I made it three, three ingredients. Three ingredients in a two-ingredient cocktail because I'm a rebel. In, to, as an homage to the late, great Paul Rubens, a.k.a. P.B. Herman, I'm a rebel, a loner. Things about me you wouldn't want to know. Uh, 
Today's cocktail is literally the perfect. You can just pull it out of your fridge, out of your cabinet, do whatever. Summer cocktail. If you ever want a summer cocktail that's just simple, straightforward, and a classic, do this. Ladies and gentlemen, today's cocktail of the day is one of the simplest cocktails you will ever have, but yet yeah, one of the most refreshing, just delicious feel good summer cocktails you can possibly have. It's available in every bar across the world. It's available in your own home, or at least it should be. It is the gin and tonic, the gin tonic. Snoop Dogg had a song about it, man. That's how, that's how awesome this cocktail is. It's simple, it's straightforward, and it is so delicious. Uh, first, you want to start with a glass, and in your glass, drop in uh, the, the juice fresh squeezed juice of half of a lime and then quarter the lime and drop the lime into your glass. To your glass, add two ounces of any gin you have. Me, I'm using Bombay Sapphire today, not because it's the greatest gin in the world, just because it was the closest one to my door when I opened the door. So pour that it straight into your glass and then top it off with any tonic water you have. Just top it off. There you go. And if you have a bar spoon or a chopstick or, or even a spoon, just, just give it a quick swizzle. You don't want to stir the hell out of it because then you'll lose all the bubbles. Just quickly stir it. And that's all there is to it. If you want it a little bit sweeter, you can add some simple syrup to it. But this is a classic gin cocktail, amazingly refreshing for these hot summer days like we're experiencing now. Cheers. Oh, that is good. Oh, and if you want to be really extra bougie, just a little dried lime wheel. There you go. Look at that. Bam. All right. That's that's it. Let me clear off the desktop and then we'll get down to business here on this Friday. Yeah, see, uh, Rose says that's one her husband likes to keep in the freezer. See, I almost made a mistake. I accidentally put the rum in the freezer and we almost had a rum and tonic cocktail, which I mean would, would not have been very good. So that's why I went for the uh, Bombay Sapphire because I went, oh my God, this is rum that I put in the freezer. So I had to run across the room to the whiskey smoking room and just grab the closest gin and run back here. Uh, so that's where we are. So <laughs> thank you to everybody for being here tonight. We've got 139 of you here now. That is that is shockingly low. That is That is disturbingly low. There needs to be five times that number of people here because this is a great topic. I wish I could get everybody as excited about Clarence Darrow as I am about it, Clarence Darrow. Any any great orator, any great lawyer, try a lawyer, worth his salt, has studied, knows of, and respects the man of the night, Clarence Darrow. And we're going to be talking about him. And, and, and again, as I said, the reason we're talking about Clarence Darrow tonight is because YouTube didn't want us to talk about him two days ago. <laughs> and they... They did a massive uh, copyright takedown because I was showing a TED Talk. A TED Talk from people at TED Talk who say, please disseminate this work. Just don't monetize it. I did that, and they nailed me. And I frankly don't have time to worry about the appeal. I filed an initial appeal, but they rejected it. And said, oh, after a careful review, which I doubt, we found that it does violate the, the community guidelines, so your, your, your strike warning stays. Losers, degenerates, all of you. But thank you, too, for giving me this platform, even though you're complete cocks. Um, all right. Here we are. That's what we're doing. And we'll, we'll do this. We'll do as long as we can. We've got a few things to talk about in relation to Clarence Darrow. Uh, what we're going to do is do a little bit of a biography, talk about some of his big cases, uh, and talk about his influence in popular culture. And then what I want to do is read... Some read an expert, expert, read an excerpt from one of his most famous closing arguments, the Leopold and Loeb case, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit. I mean, I will do no justice whatsoever to the amazing oratory abilities of this man, but hopefully you'll get the uh, you'll get the impact of his words, his word choice, because we talked about that when we were talking about what makes a great defense lawyer, what makes a great advocate. You know, is it the word choice? Is it their elocution? Is it their their showmanship? Is it their knowledge of the law? Of course, it's a combination of all of these, but what are the big parts? What are the big parts of this? And Clarence Darrow had the whole package. 
He had everything. And I, I want to share him with you. So at some point, we're there. I have searched and searched and searched, and there's only one video that I have ever been able to find of Clarence Darrow actually speaking on camera. I'm sure there's more out there. I'm sure there's been more that's recorded, but I couldn't find it. There's only been one that I found. Yes, not scopes. Uh, no, we'll, we'll talk about scopes here in a bit. But yeah, not not scopes. Scopes was interesting. Scopes was a show trial. That was a manufactured trial. But we'll talk about. So I want to say welcome. Welcome to the mods. Welcome to the Vice Squad chat. And again, welcome to Lincoln Kane for dropping the pity, the pity members, the memberships, the gifted memberships. If, if you've got any of these 50 gifted memberships, please give Lincoln Kane of Western Australia the amazing shout out that he deserves for being such a great guy. Where do we start with this? Oh, we, oh we, we, we're not quite done with the back of house stuff. Don't forget to take the like and subscribe poll. Again, lame, unprepared, stupid poll. But it's just to remind you that the like button exists and the subscribe button exists. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and take our little poll. Did you like and subscribe? Yes, because I'm smart. No, I'm stupid, but I fixed it. <laughs> Those are your two options. So please. Hit that like and subscribe button. Tell all your friends. Share this with people. Uh, those of you that are watching on replay, make sure you hit the like as well. Uh, post it to all your social media. Draw attention to us. Let's keep growing. Uh, I'm not sure where we are exactly on subscribers right now because uh, we're, we're doing the post trial, post YNW Melly, and post Taylor Ship Business trial uh, pilgrimage of subscribers. Let's call it that. Let's call it what it is. Uh, subscribers leave. Uh, currently, we have, according to my YouTube studio, 63,700 subscribers exactly. So that's a great thing. We're doing great. That's fine. And we've lost about 37 since the end of the business trial, but yeah, understandable, completely acceptable, but we gained way more than we lost, so no problems. Uh, super chats are active and awesome. Your, your super chats are not required to engage with me, but it does guarantee that you will get whatever you, whatever you super chat read, addressed, answered to the best of my ability. Uh, so that's my gift. If you're going to part with your hard earned money to support my channel, that's the least I can do is acknowledge that by reading your super chat, addressing it and answering it to the best of my ability. Otherwise we'll pick and choose the uh, comments as we go through the ones that I, I happen to notice. Uh, <laughs> And Swan Lake Lady says that corn pulp, I think the quinine in the tonic water gives it a bitter taste. Yes, that is true. Uh, gin used to be like horrible. Uh, and they started adding quinine to it to uh, combat things back. It was like back in the sailor days, you know, the, the old sailing ships and whatnot. They would drink the gin, but they would add quinine to it because quinine, it, uh, it helps you prevent scurvy. So it was it was sort of a medicinal thing. They added they added tonic water with quinine in it to gin to one make the gin taste better and two to sort of give you this little buffer against scurvy. Uh, there you go. There's your little your little cocktail fact for the day. Uh, good to see you here, Flux. I'm I'm in a Flux mood today. Flux has been good. Flux is an awesome person. We we love our mod Flux. She has a great channel, even though she allegedly killed my dog. And there's an interesting, this is just a stupid thing that we're doing on YouTube that's coming up. For those of you that don't know, Flux over at House of Flux, all one word, two X's, her channel, Flux. She's also one of our mods. She does a Minecraft stream. And in her Minecraft stream, her alpha male dog, of course it's the alpha male dog, is called Jeff, named after me. Um, it recently met its demise. Some people say she murdered the dog. Some people say it was an unfortunate accident. It's picked up streamed to where she try, allegedly tried to hide it. Depending who you ask, she may have she may have, have been so distraught by the accidental death that she deleted two weeks of her Minecraft building to go back to resurrect her previous saved version of Jeff the Alpha Male Dog. Or, according to others, in an attempt to hide her horrible crime of intentionally killing Jeff by pushing him off a cliff or arranging for him to fall off a cliff, she tried to hide that fact by going back. But it got to the point where there is actually going to be a legitimate trial of Flux. Flux will be on trial for the murder 
of her dog, Jeff. Uh, so far, I'm not sure how it's going, but Steve Gosney will be her defense lawyer. I'm not sure who's prosecu prosecuting. I think David from MLS Law is going to be for the prosecutor. I will be sitting as judge in the matter. Uh, so we're, we're actually going to stream a trial of flux for the murder of Jeff sometime in September or October. So stand by for that. That'll be fun. We're going to do a full-on flux trial. Flux on trial. Steve Gosney is her appointed attorney. The prosecutor will most likely be David from MLS Law, and I will be the judge. And uh, we will see how it's going to say. We'll, flux says Steve Gosney is going to save me. So yeah, we'll we'll see how that goes. That yeah. Oh, it, oh, it is silly. So we're gonna we're we're trying to find a time to do the arraignment. We don't have a trial date yet, Flux. We're gonna we're trying to find a time to do the arraignment where we get Flux to stand up in front of the court and me as judge and uh, plead her plead guilty or innocent to the charges against her or stand moot, which is probably what's gonna happen if her prosecutor is worth his salt. So stand by for that. That'll be the arraignment will be sometime in September. The trial will likely be in October. It'll be a fun little event. It's kind of fun. Uh, so stand by for that. Uh, that that's just kind of the silliness we do here. Jason J starting off the super chats. Jason J with a five dollar super chat. For the record, Minecraft actually Minecrafted Jeff the dog. I was there. I saw it. Case closed. Flux is innocent. Well, we'll just have to see what the evidence shows. Because as I always say, in all of the trials we cover. It's not who is right or wrong. It's not what happened or what didn't happen. It's what can the prosecution prove? What can the prosecution prove? And what does the defense have, if anything, to counteract the proof that's been provided by the prosecutor? That's the unfortunate reality of the law. Who's right and wrong literally means nothing in the grand scheme of justice in the court system. The only thing that matters is what can you prove? Which is going back full circle where we come to be with Clarence Darrow. What can you prove? Is it always necessary to prove through facts and law? Or can you actually convince some, someone of your point of view just through your words alone? That's something to look at. And that's something we are going to consider as we go through the trials and, and talk a little bit about who Darrow was, what he did for the legal landscape, and what we can learn from him. Because he is he's one of my top three heroes. The top three heroes are F. Lee Bailey, Jerry Spence, and Clarence Darrow. We talked about F. Lee Bailey on Wednesday. We talked about, we talked about Jerry Spence until... Ted talk nuked us for talking about Jerry Spence in a video they wanted us to share with people. Uh, we didn't get to Clarence Darrow. So we're going to get to Clarence Darrow today. And hopefully, hopefully you will enjoy it. Because yeah, I think I'm going to enjoy it. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're here doing it with you. Let me just check one thing here real quick. And then we shall dive into Clarence Darrow. The great Clarence Darrow, the legend Clarence Darrow, one of the greatest orator lawyers in the history of lawyering. Let's start. Who, who was Clarence Darrow? There's a picture of him in my thumbnail. So if you look at the thumbnail, that's Clarence Darrow. He was a, a champion of the downtrodden. He took on unpopular cases and made them his own. Uh, yeah, we'll be talking about that. Grant Rocha, the 1960 movie Inherit the Wind was based on Darrow's, one of Darrow's cases. Absolutely correct with uh, Henry Fonda. Um, well, where do we start? Let's start with a little bit of a, a biography. Of him. Who, who was he? Clarence Darrow, he was born in 1857 in Ohio, and he died in 1938 in Chicago. So like 185 years ago. <laughs> well, well, I'm uh, did I say 100? I meant 85, not 185, he died like 85 years ago. Uh, he, he worked mainly as a defense counsel in cases that were mundane 
and cases that were very, very dramatic and some of the most important cases in the history of the United States. He is dead. If you were to create a lawyer hall of fame, he would be first ballot original inductee to the lawyer hall of fame. He was a great public speaker, debater, writer, and lawyer. He attended law school for only one year. One year. He, was a, he went to law school for one year before he was admitted to the Ohio Bar in 1878. And then about nine years later, he moved to Chicago. And he took part, there were these famous hay riot markets, anar hay, hay, hay market riots, where anarchists were, were charged with murder. And he immediately took part in those trials. He was friends with the judge in that case, who was later the governor of Illinois. And uh, he was appointed by the, he was appointed the Chicago City Corporation Council in 1890. So he worked for the city of Chicago. And then he became the attorney general for Chicago and Northwestern Railway. The, I mean, sorry, the general attorney, not the attorney general, the general attorney for Chicago and Northwest Railway. Then he left Northwestern to defend Eugene V. Debs. Uh, Eugene V. Debs, if you don't know who he was, he was the president of the American Railway Union, and he was one of the great uh, strike leaders in Chicago history. He was one of the great union strikers in Chicago, and he was charged. He ran for president a bunch of times. He was charged with a bunch of crimes, and Clarence Darrow defended him on federal charges of contempt arising from a big strike that happened in 1894. Now, unfortunately, Debs and his, uh, his co-defendants, they were, they were convicted, and the decision was upheld by the Supreme Court, but Darrow established through that case a national reputation as a labor and criminal lawyer that was unparalleled at the time. So he represented labor unions across the country in arbitrations and lawsuits and other things. And he also, uh, he fought, his two, big, his two big things in life were child labor and the death penalty. He labored strongly against child labor and strongly against the death penalty. And uh, then World War I. Uh, after World War I, he defended a lot of these war protesters who, you know, didn't, who, who essentially didn't agree with the draft status. A lot of war protesters. Um, and back then they had the state sedition laws where it was a seditious act. It was a tr nearly a treasonous act to not go to war. And so he defended a lot of these uh, World War I protesters. And then in 1924, he got one of the, if not the seminal case in his life, the case of Leopold and Loeb. It was uh, Richard, it was Nathan, Nathan, was it Nathaniel or Nathan? Nathan, Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb. They were rich kids who were destined for greatness. Their family was incredibly wealthy. Uh, one of them had been accepted to Harvard Law. Another one, had been, he'd been accepted to law school elsewhere. They were rich kids that committed a heinous murder for no reason other than they just wanted to commit a murder. That's it. They murdered a 14-year-old boy, Bobby Franks, Robert Franks. Uh, then, the next year was the legendary Scopes Monkey Trial. What's the Scopes Monkey Trial? You think you may think you've never heard of the Scopes Monkey Trial, but you have. You just don't, you may not know you've heard of it, but you have. In the Scopes Monkey Trial, John T. Scopes was the defendant. He was a school teacher. He was a high school teacher who had broken a state law. Back then, there was a state law in Dayton, Tennessee. Ten is where it happened. In Tennessee, there was a state law that said it is illegal, it is against the law to teach the Darwinian theory of evolution. It was illegal to teach evolution. You were required by state law to teach creationism in the high school back in 1925. Well, he broke that law. 
John T. Scopes intentionally broke that law to intentionally be put on trial for breaking that law. So he taught the theory of evolution. He was charged with teaching the theory of evolution. And to the, to, not, not two of the, the greatest legal minds of that time clashed for this trial. They came together. On the for the prosecution, you had William Jennings Bryan, who is a legend in his own right. For the he was he was for the prosecution. And you had Clarence Darrow for the defense. Now, in this case, well, we'll talk, we'll talk about the case a little bit later. But the, the, the only regrettable thing about that is both. Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan agreed that there would be no record made of their closing arguments. So we only have distant tales of what happened. And then the following year, so year one, I mean, one year he defends Leopold and Loeb. The next year he represents the defense in the Scopes Monkey Trial which as we, as we just mentioned in chat, there was a great movie starring Henry Fonda called Inherit the Wind that was all about the Scopes Monkey Trial. This dude is so good, he's getting movies made about him. Not just one, there's been several movies and stage plays made about Clarence Darrow. We're going to talk about a couple of those. And then, so one year, it's Leopold and Love. The next year, it's the Scopes Monkey Trial. The year following that was the legendary Sweet Case, where there was a black family that had fought against a mob that was trying to expel it from their neighborhood in Detroit. They didn't, they didn't want no blacks in their neighborhood. And the, the, this, this mob, just like a, a modern day mob was trying to get these people expelled from the neighborhood and Daryl represented them. And he acquitted them. He acquitted the black, he, he got an, acqu an acquittal for the black family. So he, I mean, he's, he's been, you know, regaled throughout history as one of the greatest lawyers ever. And he was incredibly well-read in, in sociology, philosophy, politics, and his closing arguments were just filled, as we're going to see later, with all of these references and allusions to everything that he's read throughout his life. His speeches and his writings you know, just advocated unrestricted freedom of expression. He was a huge First Amendment opponent. Just he advocated absolute unrestricted freedom of expression. He opposed, as I mentioned earlier, capital punishment, you know, prohibition. He was totally against prohibition, which was a constitutional amendment that outlawed the sale of alcohol in America. He was totally against that, totally opposed to that. Uh, you know, the governmental protective deals. He he was a huge supporter of of labor unions. He was against the League of Nations, which sort of became the UN later. He's written several books and he put himself out there in other cases, which uh, are not as well known, but we've talked about here on this channel. We've talked about a case of Clarence Darrow's that you probably were not aware of that he was involved in. If you watch Maritime Monday a long time ago, several months ago, we did a case called the SS Eastland. And we did the SS Eastland because one of the other great YouTube channels, uh, Ask a Mortician. She did a she did a stream about the SS Eastland, and she was demonetized for it for, for talking about this important maritime case. And I restreamed her streaming uh, her her video of the SS Eastland to uh, show my solidarity to her. And I also got demonetized for that stream. But the SS Eastland was a ship that capsized in the Chicago River. Uh, we talked about that. If you want to go back, go into my Maritime Monday playlist and search for the SS Eastland. We did that case. It capsized at the dock, at the pier, at the wharf in the Chicago River. It just kind of tipped over in the water. And it was one of the greatest maritime casualties in Chicago or on the entire Great Lakes in history. And ordinarily, when things like that happen, the first thing people do is they they lawyer up. And in that case, the captain. Uh, the chief engineer, some other crewmen were arrested almost immediately and charged in the deaths that occurred 
the hundreds of deaths that occurred in the capsizing of this ship at the wharf in the Chicago River. And uh, that's in, the, in the criminal pleadings, there were six people that were charged. Uh, Captain Henry Peterson, uh, Chief Engineer Joseph Erickson, two ship owners, two steamboat inspection people, and uh, the chief engineer, the chief engineer Joseph Erickson, was represented by Clarence Darrow. And it's, it's, a, it's not a popular case. It's not been popularized. But he went full Clarence Darrow in this case. Now, what happened is you've heard like grand juries. There's, there's, you've heard people say that grand juries, they can, you know, they can indict, uh, you know, a, a sandwich, a ham sandwich, I believe is how the saying goes, because grand juries are a one sided affair. The prosecution says, here's all the evidence I have against this person. Well, not all of it. Here is some of the evidence I have against this person. I think we should charge them with a crime. And then the grand jury will decide whether or not to charge them. Virtually every case where the where a grand jury is convened, they bring charges against the accused because the accused gets no say. They have no defense during the grand jury proceedings. Well, in this case, the chief engineer appointed Clarence Darrow to handle the proceedings. And this is this wasn't your local run-of-the-mill neighborhood grand jury. This was a federal grand jury. The federal grand jury convened to determine whether or not the defendants would face trial in Chicago. This was it. The, the grand jury was in Michigan. Um, but in the grand jury arguments, Clarence Darrow was allowed to make arguments in the federal grand jury. And the whole idea in this case, it was an extradition hearing whether we extradite the people from Michigan to Chicago to face trial. Now, Clarence Darrow was actively defending his client, the chief engineer, in these proceedings, these grand jury proceedings for extradition and charging in Chicago. His arguments in the grand jury were proceedings were so persuasive, were so well put together that not only did the judge rule that there would be no extradition, the judge ruled that the capsizing itself was purely an accident and that none of the six defendants, he was only representing one of the defendants, but his arguments were so good before this federal grand jury that the judge said that none of the, even the other five that Daryl wasn't representing, his arguments were so good, he got the other five complete acquittals as well. The judge ruled that it was an accident and nobody would face a criminal trial. So there was no legal findings of any criminal negligence on the part of the owners or their employees in this case. That's how badass Clarence Darrow was. He goes in representing one client fighting against extradition from Michigan to Illinois, and he walks out with the judge determining that none of the six people, even the five that were not defended by Clarence Darrow, aren't going to be charged with anything. That's how badass dude was. That's how good Clarence Darrow was. Right. Silent PS is sweet, a six fur. Yeah, he got a six fur when he was only going for a one fur. <laughs> you don't get much better than that. And we've got a bass who's been a member of for nine months is high, Jeff. Darrow sounds based. Darrow was the based, basiest based guy that ever based. If there was baseness back then, he would be the definition of base. That's who he is. <laughs> Chandler, Chandler Remington. Hi, Chandler. We miss you over on Mean Copium Stream. Uh, I love Clarence Darrow. I love Clarence Darrow too, as you can tell. You might, you might have noticed I got a little bit excited because I love words. I love oratory. I love when people use words to weave magic. And as we talked about on Wednesday, on Wednesday, there's not a lot of lawyers. There's not a lot of lawyers who have that ability to 
to paint these amazing word pictures with their language, their delivery. We've lost, it's a lost art. It, it's not a lost art. It's very nearly a lost art. Yeah, I am so excited about it because he's awesome. There's a reason Jeff Jeff isn't streaming his pants to stream. I, <laughs> and uh, Jim Satal says, Legal Vices, I'm shocked as someone who grew up in Chicago and attended Chicago public schools that I never heard of this before. I've only heard of the tale of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Yeah, go back and watch the go back and watch the uh, the SS Eastland video. It's really, really good. I don't I didn't talk about Clarence Darrow during that stream. Uh, because it, it wasn't really important to the stream, but it's important to this stream, so I brought it up. Um, and there may be, I may be uh, guesting with someone, brick and mortar, not, not brick and mortar, uh, maritime horrors, to talk about the SS Eastland and a little bit of Clarence Darrow's involvement in that. At some point in the future, I hope, we're working on it. But... As we said, they've, they've made a movie about the Scopes Monkey Tribe uh, called Inherit the Wind. But the, the Leopold and Loeb case is a, it's a very, very interesting case. Because it was so heinous. It was so thoughtless. It was so just empty. Uh, Sheila Ferrari says, ask a mortician's video on that topic, said that it was a very unknown case in the Chicago area. Yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, I based my SS Eastland video on ask a mortician's video because she got, she got uh, demonetized for that. And I also got demonetized for using hers as a basis, but I, I wanted to do it to show, to show YouTube that uh, it's purely educational. So yeah, it, you watch watch my video and also watch Ask a Mortician's video. My video contains Ask a Mortician's video uh, because she is so good at what she does. Well, what what is this what is this Leopold and Love case that I keep talking about? Uh, let, before we get into that, let me check here to make sure we've got uh, we got everything covered. Uh, fast, we got yours. Uh, okay, we got all of the all of the super chats, all of the gifted memberships, and all of the uh, monthly membership chats out of the way, right? So we can we can move on to the Leopold and Love case again. Just so you know, the the super chats get your comments read and noted. Uh, moving right along, let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, we we're going to talk about the Leopold and Love case. It was a pretty. It was. It was a very heinous case, actually. Uh, two two people, Nathan Leopold, and his friend Richard Loeb. As I mentioned earlier, they they came from wealth, amazing wealth for the time. They wanted for nothing. They had all the money they needed. Which was that was one of the charges against them. They they kidnapped the guy because of gambling debts. They owed like ninety dollars, and that is a motivation that made no sense because they had thousands upon thousands of dollars at their fingertips. But uh, what happened was in the early nineteen hundreds, uh, these two wealthy students at the University of Chicago, one of whom had been accepted to Harvard. They just randomly picked a 14-year-old boy, Bobby Franks, uh, in Chicago in May 1924. They kidnapped him off the street after school, and they murdered him. They called it the crime of the century back then. Uh, they just murdered the kid. And they did it because they had... Uh, they had become sort of steeped in the philosophy of Nietzsche, the idea of the Ubermensch, the Superman, uh, you know, the, the id ruling things. Uh, and, and their reason, their stated reasons to commit the murder was they were hoping to dis, to uh, demonstrate their superior intellect. 
they they believed through the teachings of Nietzsche and others that they were entitled, entitled by their wealth to carry out this perfect crime without consequences because they were better than everybody else. They felt it was just, and there's some parallels to the Taylorship business trial here. Because if you watch the Taylorship business trial, you would notice she didn't seem to have any emotion about murdering, chopping up her boyfriend, uh, sexually assaulting him after his death. She didn't have an emotional response to this. This was very much what happened with the Leopold and Love case. They felt they were just better than everyone else. And they, they, it was, they were entitled, they were entitled to kill this 14-year-old boy just to do it and feel, have the experience without any consequences. But they were arrested, obviously. What they did is they murdered the boy. They drove around for a while with him in the car. They stripped off his clothes so he couldn't be identified and stuffed his body in a culvert in a river. Uh, but of course they were arrested. And the family, because they were rich they were able to retain Clarence Darrow as their lead counsel. And they had this great battle in court. But the interesting thing was they pled guilty. They admitted to what they did. It wasn't they did they, did they or did they not do it. They admitted guilt. And essentially the entire case was the closing arguments where the prosecution was seeking the death penalty for these two boys. One was 18, one was 19. Uh, JKD Bucks 76 says, read crime and punishment. Raskolnikov killed the two women because he overdosed on philosophy. Uh, Raskolnikov was, he did study philosophy. Um, and like crime and punishment is one of my it's 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 the one of the books that I love the most and it's one of the books I hate the most. I hate it because of just the visceral like horror that's in that book. It's a classic tale of every decision is the wrong decision and it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Uh yeah, he, he felt entitled to kill the it, it basically centers around he pawned some stuff to an old woman. He went to get his stuff back and then he killed the pawnbroker. And then it just kind of went downhill from there, but it's kind of basically the same thing. Yeah. You know, it's they he committed the crime for no real reason. Uh, and uh, that was a bad decision. And then every decision after that was the bad decision. Uh, so yeah, you, you cry, read crime and punch. It's, it's a, it's a wonderful, horrible book, but he argued the, the, the gist of his argument was against sentencing these two boys slash men to death. Now, at this point, this is the interesting thing. At this point, they were 19, 18 and 19. So today we would say they were adults. They were men. But back then in the 1920s, uh, 21 was considered the age of majority. 21 was considered the age of adulthood. When did we start saying that 18-year-olds were adults? When did we, when did we describe 18-year-olds as adults? When did we change the laws to make the age of majority 18. Go back and look at like the Vietnam War. Because he can't send children to war. We needed to send 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds to war. So, hey, how do we do that? We raise the age of adulthood. I mean, we lower the age of adulthood from 21 to 18 so that we can draft 18 and 19 year olds and send them to war. Exactly. Some of you are saying like the draft in wartime. Exactly. Um, what was a world war two? I, I, I thought it was the Vietnam war somewhere around there, but anyway, it was, before, it was after this and it did center around war. So I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, it was either world war two or Vietnam where we lowered the age from 21 to 18 so that we could send children to war. So at the time that, yeah, I, I thought it was Vietnam. Uh, Daily Quick Bite says Nam Vietnam. Woofer says Vietnam. Yeah, that's what I thought. We, it, you were, you had to be 21 to be an adult up until that point. But we needed to draft the children, and the average age of the soldier in Vietnam was 19. So we were able to send the 18 and 19 year olds to war. Back in this day, they were still considered children legally. 
They were considered kids, children. They were not considered adults until they were 21. So one was three years away from adulthood. One was two years away from adulthood. And that figured into uh, Clarence Darrow's arguments. Interesting how history works, isn't it? Isn't it? Okay, in April 1970, is part. this is from Grant Russia, uh, legislation to extend the Voting Rights Act of 1965, Congress controversially lowered the voting age to 18. So that's where we were. The, the murders were committed by legal children at the time. And they, the, the rich families, uh, they, attained, they uh, retained Clarence Darrow to represent them. And in their defense, Clarence Darrow made the closing arguments, arguing against the death penalty. And I know Steve Gosney's written a book on the death penalty, arguments for and against. I know we've had other discussions with Steve and others about the death penalty. I am pro-death penalty. But I will say that of all the things that I've read in my entire life, Clarence Darrow's closing arguments in the Leopold and Loeb case, they come closest to convincing me to be anti-death penalty. And this is 85 years later. That's how powerful these arguments were. And his closing arguments, and what we're going to do at the end of the show today, we're going to, we're going to read some excerpts from his closing arguments. We can't read the entire closing arguments. Why? Because his closing arguments were 12 hours long. He gave a 12-hour closing argument. It spanned two days in the courtroom. And printed, it comes out to be about, I think it's 63 pages. When it's printed out. So we can't read the whole thing. So I highlighted some points that I think show his ability as an orator to argue against sentencing to death two people who knowingly, cold-heartedly, and just for the sole thrill of it, kidnapped, murdered, and hid the body of a 14-year-old boy. He argued for 12 hours against the death penalty. And he won. They were sentenced to life in prison, uh, plus 99 years. Uh, but then in 1936, Lo Loeb was murdered by another prisoner, and... Uh, Leopold was actually released on parole in 1958. Um, yeah, that's a, that's one. I mean, like the two famous cases for Clarence Darrow are the Scopes Monkey Trial and Leopold and Loeb. Leopold and Loeb is probably the more famous from the legal side because we have a record of the arguments. The Scopes Monkey Trial, the, the teaching evolution in school trial, is could be said to be more famous because we're still dealing with the after effects of this case a hundred years later. But we don't have the arguments. We don't have a record of the arguments. That... Bass! Long time no super chat here on Legal Vices. Bass bringing the $20 super chat heat. Read the whole thing. Don't be a chicken. Yeah, we don't have a... I'm, we, I actually thought about doing it as part of my 24-hour stream that'll probably be coming up at the end of this month, if not the beginning of next month, because I owe you guys a 24-hour stream. I said I would do a 50,000 subscriber 24-hour stream. We're already up to 63,000. I haven't done it. So I thought about doing it as part of that, but I don't know. We'll see. We can, maybe we can serialize it. I don't know. Uh, my dad always felt that if you're old enough to go to war, you're old enough to vote and drink. Well, that's exactly why they lowered the, they didn't still didn't lower the drinking age, but they lowered the voting age so that they could send people to war and die. Uh, but anyway, thank you so much, Bass, for that super chat. Deeply, deeply appreciated. Uh, that's what super chats do. They get read immediately. And uh, I, it, we should have a, we should have a bell ringing sound, but apparently it doesn't work. Because it didn't work at all yesterday. If you heard a bell just now, yay me. If you didn't, 
Well, that's exactly what happened yesterday. Uh, but we do, we do have a foghorn for the fifty dollar and above super chat. Uh, but yeah, the, for some reason I can't get any version of a ship's bell to work on my little stream deck sound effect. So, oh, the the little bell worked. Wait, what? The th this little bell worked. Can you hear the little bell? Did you guys just hear a little bell, a little ship's bell? The, it's not a cowbell. It should be like a ding ding ship bell. See, that's the problem. It, you, you, it all sounds like a cowbell to people. Uh, and it shouldn't be quiet. Because it's up at 100% volume. Yeah, see, I got to work on that. I need, I need to figure it out. Yeah, it's more of a clonk. It shouldn't be a clonk. It should be a ding ding. So that we're trying to figure. No matter what version of a ship's bell I've, I've tried to use, it sounds lame, or you can't hear it at all. But the, uh, the foghorn thing is real, and I know it's real because Bella Stella, Bella Stella, you truly are a great supporter of this channel, and. I honestly cannot thank you enough for the support that you, you you've given me over time, the support you consistently show to the channel. I mean, these, these kind of super chats, you, 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 I mean, you guys literally have no idea how speechless it makes me. Very few things render me speechless. Uh, the fact that any of you, whether it's a dollar or a hundred dollars part with your hard earned money to support this channel, it freaks me out a little bit. I must admit every time, uh, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the high value thing like Bella Stella dropping the hundy, uh, no super chats. We need to fix this. Happy Friday, Larax. You get a foghorn. Bella Stella, thank you so, so much. And because this is what we do, the straight up hundred dollar shots, they get a they get a shot of whiskey. We do a shot and a thanks. Um uh what do we got here? We'll do a shot of Bushmills. Bushmills Irish whiskey. That's what I've got sitting here next to me. Bella Stella. Oh, ooh, it's got some, some melted ice water in it. Bella Stella, honest to God. I deeply, deeply appreciate your support. Thank you so much for, for everything. You truly are a great supporter. I'm speechless. Love you. Thank you so much for everything you've done. Cheers. And happy Friday. Okay, that was kind of a double. <laughs> it's like when you put it in your mouth and you like you swallow and you go, oh my god, I just have to swallow again. Um, phrasing. <clears throat> That's kind of how it was. Whoo, okay. Thank you so much. And Mr. K, wow. That's a picture. <laughs> okay, is, is that like is that Rikeda as Kim Jong un? Wow. That's good. Mr. K, member for two months of the Clean and Sober crew, says, hey there, give me another one of these free chat things. I feel obligated to use them to tell you the C is always right. We 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 we, we don't bring that uh, Amazon Lord of the Rings crap around here. The C is never right in that Thank you very much for that, Mr. K. <laughs> Did, oh, well, well, I guess that also requires a, the, the straight up hundy. That also requires that we do one thing. Release the hounds. We need to release the hounds. Um, let me see. Are we set up? Okay. Now we got doggo cam incoming. Um, let's see. Well, the dogs are always like across the room from each other. So we'll we'll go with Yoda. We'll do the Yoda cam here. Let me give me just a quick second while we set up Yoda cam. Oh my God! Hang on, I actually have to stand up. And of course, pants are prison, so I have to turn off my camera so I can get Yoda cam. All righty. All right, hang on. Just give me a quick second here, then we'll get back to Clarence Darrow. We're setting up Doggo McDoggy Cam. Uh, uh, right. 
set up extra camera. There we go. And boom. Let me zoom it on in here. It's firing up. Just give me a quick second, folks. I wasn't expecting to get to doggo cam, so I didn't have it locked and loaded and ready to go. Uh, but now I do. All right, we'll get like uh, smash face Yoda here. Yoda's looking particularly smash face today, by the way he's sitting. Uh, let me zoom in on the Yoda mug here. Do you want to, oh my God, are you going to make me update this? Don't do that. There's a new version. It's already on, but I know. I don't want to do the new version yet, so leave me alone. No. There we go. Oh, my gosh. It's not letting me zoom the camera in anymore because it, it says I have to update it before I do that. Well, you suck. You suck, media cam. And I'm going on vacation on Wednesday for two weeks, and I'm coming back with an amazing new camera. So hopefully my, my handsome face here will be even better than it normally is. Uh, we got a good camera coming. Uh, but here we go. Let's bring up doggo cam. That's the best we can do because it won't it won't let me it won't let me zoom in any further on Yoda until I up, upgrade and I can't upgrade because I'm in the middle of a stream. So there we go. Oh wait, maybe it will. Nope, it won't. So screw you. Stupid thing. Uh, let me let me see if I can if I can uh, backdoor this a little bit. Crazy. Nope, that's the best we can do. So there's Master Yoda sleeping peacefully. We'll switch it over to Strawberry here in just a little bit. But uh, need to give Yoda the, the camera. Show. Yeah, he's dreaming. He's dreaming about something. See if we can at least eh, level it out. Yep, all right, there we go. That's doggo cam for today with Yoda sleeping peacefully. Why is Yoda so cute? Asked Chandler Remington. Because Yoda is cute, and I chose Yoda. So, therefore, Yoda is cute. Uh, all right. Where was I? Oh, we were, oh we, we were just getting ready to do the other. Bass. The amount and above makes it a fog. A fogget. Yep. This amount. $50 makes it a fogget. So that's the, the, the Foggit sound. $50, $50 and above gets the big horn. And over the weekend, I'll try to work on the uh, little little bell for the other streams. But Bass, thank you as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. I deeply, deeply appreciate it. Truly, truly, truly a gentleman. Thank you. <sighs> wow. <clears throat> Yeah, don't change software in the middle of the street. I, we know me. I like to touch things. I like to touch things. Just don't touch it. Don't touch it during the stream. We, we've learned just don't touch it during the stream. All right, so where are we? We've, we've talked about the Leopold and Loeb case. And now I want to show you how, how inspirational, how, how much of is Hal is from 2001 A Space Odyssey. I'm sorry, Dave. I can't do that. Um, yeah, that, that Godzilla, that is actually a real, a real road sign. It's all reflective and everything. You can see it. It's just, it's sideways. It should be you know, diamond shaped, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to mount it on the wall here eventually, but that's actually a street sign that was produced by a, a street sign company in Japan. I just love it. So if you shine the light on it, it's all reflective, just like a real street sign. It's the HAL 9000. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Great movie. So, how big of an influence on law and society was Clarence Darrow? So, we, they made one movie about the Scopes Monkey Trial, at least one movie starring Henry Fonda, the Inherit the Wind, but also, and I, because of the the current strike I have on the channel, I have to be really careful here um, in showing other, other videos. But there's been another movie made about the Leopold and Loeb case. It is this movie right here. 
Kevin Spade playing Clarence Darren. It's in the film titled Darrow. Your Honor, I have stood here for three months as one might stand at the ocean trying to sweep back the tide. I have heard in the last few weeks nothing but a cry for blood. I never saw such enthusiasm for the death penalty as I've seen here. It's been discussed as a holiday, like a day at the races. I've heard words from the state's attorney that would shame a savage. So we, we, we have Kevin Spacey in the movie Darrow, portraying Clarence Darrow, giving delivering the closing arguments in the Leopold and Loeb case. But even more than, even more popular, even more powerful than Kevin Spacey, who is, despite all of his personal problems, allegedly and acquitted, he's been acquitted of uh, those where his claim, his uh, accusers haven't been mysteriously died. Yeah. All of the charges against him so far have either been dismissed due to the several complainants who died, and uh, he was acquitted by a jury just uh, last week, I believe, of some other horrible things. But despite his personal quirks, cannot deny that Kevin Spacey is one of the preeminent actors of his age. And he played Clarence Darrow in the movie Darrow. But... Oh, there's, there's many movies about Darrow. Uh, this movie, Darrow, and then so we inherit the wind. And also, before Kevin Spacey, there was a movie called Compulsion. And if you were to say, who is the Clarence Darrow of actors? Who is the icon of actors? Who is one of the greatest actors in the history of humankind? You would probably have to say Orson Welles. Orson Welles played Clarence Darrow in the movie Compulsion. And he, this is also, this is Orson Welles delivering the closing arguments in the Leopold and Loeb case. This is how important, not only was, was Clarence Darrow, but also how important was the case of Leopold and Loeb. It got Orson Welles to play him. This crime is the most fiendish, cold-blooded, inexcusable case the world has ever known. That's what Mr. Horn has told this court. Your Honor, I've been practicing law a good deal longer than I ought to have. Anyhow, for 45, 46 years, during all that time, I've never tried a case where the state's attorney did not say it was the most cold-blooded, inexcusable case ever. Certainly, there was no excuse for the killing of little Polly Kessler. There was also no reason for it. It wasn't for spite or hate or for money. It's great misfortune this case is money. If Your Honor shall doom these boys to die, it'll be because their parents are rich. I hope I don't need to mention that I'll fight as hard for the poor as for the rich. If I'd come into this court alone, with two ordinary Obscure defendants who've done what these boys have done. This crime is and had been all this weirdness and notoriety and this sensational publicity. I said, Your Honor, I'm willing to enter a plea of guilty and let you sentence them to life imprisonment. Do you suppose the state's attorneys have raised their voices in protest? So th that that's just a snippet. I'm afraid to show more because of the recent copyright strike. I but uh it, Watch the movie Compulsion. Absolutely the best portrayal of Clarence Darrow I've ever seen by literally one of the greatest actors ever to walk the face of planet Earth, Orson Welles. His delivery, I would imagine, would be close to what Darrow may have done. And it may be that there was someone who watched the closing who who instructed him because they were so, they were relatively close in time, just a, you know, a couple of decades apart from when the actual trial happened to when Orson Welles performed as Clarence Darrow. <laughs> uh, a couple of comments here. Jim Satala, legal vice says Orson Welles was better in his role as wine salesman 
in those Asti Spumante commercials, Paul Masson will sell no wine before it's time. You're, yeah, those were great commercials. Like anybody that sells like a jug, uh, like a gallon jug of wine for like two fifty, <laughs> right? Two dollars and fifty cents. Like Paul Masson will spend. Will will sell no wine before it's time. Yeah, those were. Orson Welles fell. He he had fallen upon hard times by that point to to do these commercials. And as Eric Fulms pointed out, I like Orson Welles' outtakes when he was shit faced drunk trying to film a commercial. Yes, he was shit faced drunk trying to film that commercial, the Paul Masson commercial. Do that. Do yourself a favor, and and go to YouTube and check out Paul Masson or Orson Welles' outtakes. Abs. Absolutely hilarious. He was just pissed drunk. It was great. Those are some great outtakes. Thank you for mentioning those. Uh, yeah, no, both of the movies, Darrow with uh, Kevin Spacey and Compulsion with Orson Welles are fantastic movies, but Orson Welles in Compulsion was astounding, breathtakingly good. But And don't forget to search for the outtakes of Orson Welles. Uh, what was it called? The, the the movie with the with Orson Welles was Compulsion. The one with Kevin Spacey was called Darrow. Uh, Orson Welles wasn't Orson Welles responsible for tricking everyone that Mars was invading from a radio, radio program? Yes, uh, the the original uh, War of the Worlds radio broadcast it scared a lot of people into thinking it was an actual real invasion from Mars and not a radio broadcast. Yeah, he 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 is an orator. Orson Welles is an orator in his own right. Um, one of the most popular things where Orson Welles was that you may not have realized was Orson Welles, the 1980s version of Clash of the Titans. Uh, he played Zeus in that movie. Uh, so yeah, um, that's him. But what I think we need to do is hear Clarence Darrow himself. We need to hear Clarence Darrow's own voice. How did he talk in a normal, not, not in a theatrical court situation? How did he talk at any time? How did he do this? How, what was his, what was his way of, what was his manner of speaking? Well, there's one nearly 10 minute clip of him talking in 1932, 90 years ago. So the video is shit. This is a 90-year-old movie. It's a 90-year-old film transposed to VHS, transposed to YouTube. So the video is shit. I'm going to say that right now. But listen to him. Listen to how he talks. He talks about things that are, are relevant today, 90 years later. The things he is saying about the people that commit crimes, the people that are the disenfranchised, those, you know, the, the downtrodden society and the options they have available to them from a societal point of view are just as relevant 90 years after he said them. Give him a listen and uh, see what you think. This is Clarence Darrow himself in 1932, not long before he died. Just listen to his voice, listen to his passion, listen to his word choice, listen to the word pictures he paints. It's unparalleled in oratory. This, this is him in 1932. Most people think there is no cause for crime, except the pure cussedness of the one they call a criminal. But as a matter of fact, there's a cause for everything in this world. And there's no way to remove the evil without removing the cause. There's a cause for all. That's a brilliant statement. They say there's no reason for crime, but it happens. There's no way to remove the evil of crime without removing the cause of the crime. And he's going to talk about the causes of crime here. Sorts of human conduct just exactly as is a cause for all the physical action of the universe. The real cause of crime is poverty, ignorance, 
hard luck. And generally you. These almost invariably combine to produce what we call a crime. When we look at the prisoners in the jails, we find that all of them practically are poor, at least nine-tenths. And these have always been poor. At least nine-tenths began what they call a criminal career as mere children. Eleven, twelve, thirteen. At a time of life when the ways of life are fixed. Nine-tenths of them also are ignorant. They've never had the training that every intelligent parent would think was necessary to keep their child out of prison and make him safe in the community. All these things almost universally combine to put people in jail. The story of the so-called criminal is simple. He generally comes from a poor home. Orphan, half orphan, are parents who can do nothing for him. He's generally less intelligent than those who have a better chance. He either had no chance to go to school or else he did not care to go to school. And our schools are not fitted to give anyone a training unless it's the old line of training which only fits one for profession. See, this is so fascinating that 90 years ago, the same problem was bad education. Education didn't prepare us for the real experiences of life. It just prepared us for one profession, just to be a professional person in, in a box. And people you know, didn't absorb this. This problem that was identified 90 years ago is still a problem in society today, and it has only gotten worse. We didn't learn anything. We didn't listen to this 90 years ago, and it has only gotten worse since then. Most of them that finally get their place in jail have no taste for books, but they could take manual training. They could prepare themselves for trades or occupation. And the man of the trade or an occupation is seldom found in prison. Then, too, hard times produce crime. Boys and men will steal when times are hard who never would steal if they had a chance to make a living in some other way. What do we need? is a patient, humane understanding of the problem and a treatment such as physicians would give to the ill. And if that was done, we could get rid of crime, but we never can get rid of it by cruel punishment and rendering boys hopeless and helpless. Isn't, isn't that the truth? We can never get rid of crime just through pure, cold, cool punishment and rendering helpless and hopeless the criminals. I think prison is just, prison is the breeding ground for more crime. And, it, it, and it, as he was saying earlier, like not everybody's for books. I had to wrap my mind, my own mind around the fact that my my own son, he, he wanted to go the hands-on approach and not the book route through college. It took a while to wrap my head around that. And he's doing fantastically well at his trades and what he's doing. And that's what he's saying. Like back then, 90 years ago, the school only taught you 
what the government wanted you to know to be a good tax paying professional. It didn't teach you apprenticeships. It didn't. I mean, now we, when I was in school, we had the option to do go into like metal shop, wood shop, small engine repair. Those classes don't exist anymore. Not everybody is meant to go to university. Not everybody is meant to go into white collar professions, but we don't teach the children that there are hands-on options. There's apprenticeships out there. There's things you can do. You, you, we don't teach them these valuable things and totally not taking another nibbles. There's nothing wrong with apprenticeship. The problem is no education at all and lots of money to make doing nothing. Absolutely. And Becca has thoughts. Also speaking the truth, you're both technically right. H.G. Wells wrote War of the Worlds and Orson Welles was the one that was perform performing it on the radio and uh, later in the movie version in the 1950s. What he's saying here is, yeah, they were taught. They're not taught anymore. These things are not taught. And the only, was the only thing in life, the commission of another crime. Mr. Darrell, in your opinion, what is the reason for the increase of crime in this country? I don't What's the reason know for increase of, increase of crime? Increase of crime or not? That's a question which can't well be answered. We do know that there's an increase in the population of our prisons, and a very decided one. The policy of America seems to be to build bigger and better prisons. That's yeah, that's our solution to the problem of crime in America. We have more people incarcerated in the United States per capita than China. Let that sink in. That's a real statistic, one that I called bullshit on until I went, holy crap, and researched and realized we do have a higher prison imprisonment rate than communist fucking China. And he is absolutely right and hardcore based in what he's saying. The only solution we have to prison and crime is to build bigger and better prisons. Same as bigger and better factories. This increase in the population of prisons has come about by the intense, cruel, unthinking hatred that has attended every effort to deal with the question of crime. It resulted in a great increase of laws and a lengthening of terms in prison. And isn't that the fucking truth? What he's just saying there. What else contributes to the increase in crime? The increase in laws and the increase in the period of punishment for breaking those laws. If you make more things illegal, more people are going to prison. That's a pretty based argument that's hard to argue against. Crime doesn't depend entirely on what people do. It depends likewise on laws. For instance, one quarter of all the people in our federal prisons are there for selling liquor. This was 1932. This was during prohibition. As we said, it was a constitutional amendment that made the sale, possession, and consumption of alcohol a crime. 25%. 25% of the people in prison in 1932 were there for selling liquor. And there's two kinds of crimes. There's the malum prohibitum and the malum in se. There, that, what, what that is, it's the, the ones that are just a crimes by their very nature. The, the malum in se, they're, they're bad because of their act, which would be like murder. Murder is bad because it's murder. And then there's the malum prohibitum. Those are the laws that they're a crime because we say they're a crime. The consumption, sale, purchase of alcohol or whatever during prohibition. That's not inherently a bad crime. It's a crime because the federal government said it was a crime. Speeding is not a crime 
it's only a crime because we say it's a crime. Though that's what he's talking about here. The reason for the crime is because the government outlaws a specific act that in and of itself may not be a crime. That contributes to the criminal nature of people. That contributes to putting people in prison. Which is not and should not be really a crime. Then the fierce hatred that has been generated against the inmates of prison have made judges give long terms. And juries find more men guilty. <laughs> Jur- there, there's some there's some good close cap stories. The, the jurors find Mormon Julie. Uh, what he's saying here is par- also part of the problem is long term judges, and we find that more jurors are, are buying into what the old term long term judges are telling us, and have put in the penitentiary more people entirely innocent of the act than ever before. It has likewise made the pardon boards give up their function and made governors afraid to release men in prison until a prisoner today can see written over the doors of the prison what Danny saw over the gates of hell. All hope abandoned. Ye who, Ye who enter here. here, yes. This Dante. is to appear a miracle. The way we do everything in this land. In the last ten years, England has closed and abandoned one quarter of all its prisons. And again, I, I apologize for the quality of this video. It's a, it's filmed 90 years ago, nearly a hundred years ago. This was filmed, transposed to videotape and then digitally work here. So this is the best we can do. Before another 10 years goes by, England does not grow panic because something happened. It has coolness, intelligence, and understanding. We often hear about the law not being enforced in, enforced in America as it is in England. Yes, the laws are enforced differently in America than in England. And yet we hang at least five times as many people as England does in proportion to our population. So per capita at this time, we were hanging, we were murdering, we were giving the death penalty to five times more people than England was per capita. And there, nearly one half of everybody who received a death sentence at the hands of a jury in England is either paroled or have their sentence reduced by the other officials of the land. While no governor and few pardoning boards dares reduce a sentence in the United States today. Sometime perhaps we'll learn where all this cruelty is leading. Bombs are is another agent in populating prisons. So where is all of this leading? It's leading to the increased population of prisons. He's saying that's where all of this is leading. That's the only place this is leading, the further population of our prisons. This infamous unscientific law has been copied by many states. This law provides that after three convictions, under the fourth, one cannot be pardoned or paroled. It's of no value, of course, to pardon people who come right back to prison. But the fact that one's been convicted three times may simply show you have three poor lawyers. 
or three cases of hard luck. Generally beginning with you. And when there's one conviction against a man, it's easier to get a second and almost sure a third, whether he's innocent or guilty. That's an interesting statement there as well. It might be difficult to get the first conviction about someone, but if they're if they're accused a second time, it's much easier to get them convicted. And the third time, you're almost assuredly to get a conviction, whether or not they did it, because he's already been convicted twice before for doing wrong things. That's a bold statement. Sometime we may understand it. Let us hope we will at least catch up with England and perhaps surpass it in understanding of these problems which are vital to the life of the state. That is Clarence Darrow in his own words. And that's just him talking on the nature of crime and punishment in America. That's not even him advocating and arguing for a case. And listen to those words he was painting, those word pictures. The, the choice of words, the passion with which he spoke. It's astounding, right? That clip is, is just one example of the reasons why Clarence Darrow is one of my personal heroes as far as great orator lawyers go. And uh, before we move on to the final phase, which will be reading some excerpts from the 12-hour closing of the Leopold and Loeb case, uh, jo Joseph DiMartino is actually literally calling me out for being wrong on everything I've said. And he is actually correct in telling me I'm wrong. I was just talking off the top of my head uh, based on my own memories, but he is absolutely correct. It was Lawrence Olivier was Zeus in uh, Clash of the Titans. <laughs> not, I yeah, it was not Orson Welles. Absolutely was Lawrence Olivier. Uh, I was wrong. I You're absolutely correct. I stuck my brain, sorry. Uh, Spencer Tracy played Darrow in Inherit the Wind. I thought it was Henry Fonda, but uh, Henry Fonda did he played Darrow in the TV version of the of the one man Broadway play Clarence Darrow, and it was it was Kevin Spacey who played the movie version of Darrow in the the, the one man Broadway play Darrow. Uh, you, they made that into the movie, and Karen, Kevin Spacey played the part. You again, absolutely correct. It was Fon Fonda in Darrow. And uh, it, it was uh, Spencer Tracy in the movie Inherit the Wind. Also, Orson Welles didn't work on the film War of the Worlds. Who was the actor that played Orson Welles in War of the Worlds then? I'm going to stick with this one. Uh, War of the Worlds. Do, 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 do. War of the Worlds. Orson Welles. Did, I mean, he was involved in the, we, we all know he was involved in the 1938 radio drama, but then there was the movie there. There was a movie of, I've, I have seen this movie where Orson Welles was, they, was doing the, the radio play for movies. Am I hallucinating this? Is this, is this uh, one, one of these memory things? Is this one of these Mandela effect things? War of the World movies. It was a 1953 movie. I thought he was in the 1953 movie. War of the Worlds, 1953. Because I I re, oh, I re distinctly remember Orson Welles doing this. Wow. This might be a total Mandela thing. He's not credited in that movie. I distinctly remember seeing Orson Welles holding like a big round R, you know, like R RKO radio microphone and delivering the War of the Worlds presentation on film. Is this a Mandela effect thing that I'm suffering here? No, no, that not not the modern Tom Cruise thing. That modern Tom Cruise thing was shit. That was just shit. But in the old movie, H.G. Wells is the writer. 
Yeah, he wrote that in like 1898, I think, is when uh, War of the Worlds was written. But H.G. not H.G. Wells, fuck Orson Welles. Orson Welles is. I know it was written by H.G. Wells. That's not in. That's not in in dis, in discussion. And the movie, no, not the new movie. There's a 1953 movie. Yes, he did the radio. He abs, Orson Welles absolutely did the radio version. But there was another movie about the War of the Worlds that I distinctly remember seeing Orson Welles holding the round RKO radio microphone and delivering it. And then they would do cut scenes between him reading it and people like freaking out in the countryside. I'm this is freaking me out because I have very clear memories of that. I, this just might be a total Mandela effect thing. Weird. Sir Cedric Hardwick was the narrator, not Orson Welles. <laughs> he, he was also on the Ten Commandments. Cedric Hardwick was a, he was the OG man. Uh, let me Cedric Hardwick War of the Worlds. Images. Let's do an image search here. No, that's not that's not the that's not the image I have in my head. Wow, weird. I think I've just been Mandela effect affected. That's weird. I hate when that happens. That's freaking me out, man. RKO 281 for the win. You saw the documentary of making the radio program. Could be, but I distinctly remember Orson Welles being in it. And I hope to God I'm, a, I, I'm remembering that correctly because otherwise I'm going to freak out. Legal Vice's Wikipedia says Orson Welles did the 1938 radio. Yes, he did the 1938 radio broadcast. That's not in question. But I thought he also was in. Wow. We all right. Anyway, we're getting. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to research this because I, if I have been Mandela effect affected, I'm gonna be freaked out because I have such clear memories. He's wearing pants, like brown pants that are kind of up over his gut, with some suspenders and a white long sleeve shirt with his. With, you know, rolled up his sleeves rolled up a little bit and he's holding one of these big round RKO radio and record microphones. I have such just just such clear memories of this. Weird. All right. Anyway, um this is beside the point. We don't want to get too distracted by that. But thank you, Joseph DiMartino, for literally correcting me on everything I said being wrong. I'm old and my memory is fading. I was just going totally off my base memory, uh, which was apparently wrong on all points. So, sorry about that. Listen to Joseph DiMardino. Uh, thank you so much for that, by the way. Wow. No, it wasn't black and white. It was, it was, it was uh, it, my brain is weird. But anyway, enough of that. What we want, we've been going an hour and 34 minutes. Now what I want to do is, I, I don't know how long this is going to take, but I, I went through the entire closing arguments and I highlighted several points that I wanted to read, that I wanted you to hear Clarence Darrow reading. And I, I, can, only, I can only imagine how he sounded, and I'm not going to do it any justice whatsoever because he's Clarence Darrow, and you know, frankly, I'm not. Um, let me... Let me figure out how we can do doggo cam here. Yeah, that's what we need to do. Well, I, I want to read this. There's no, there's no point putting the. Uh, I think that's just his promotional photo from the radio station. That could be it. That literally could be it. I mean, that's that's not out of the realm of possibility. It's the first sign of dementia. <laughs> I'm fucked. Uh, <laughs> Bell is still with the uh, here. Here, this is not a bell, it's just a thonk. It's okay to be wrong sometimes. We still love you. 
No, it, it's not that I'm wrong. I'm always wrong. Uh, but it's the fact that I have this vivid memory. And I think actually Jim Satala might be right. It might, that's ringing some bells, that it might be the promotional photo from the radio station. That might be it. The New York Times picture. Let me, let me see this. Yeah, your mind is, even Daily Quick Bites is saying, your, your mind is animating still pictures of the radio program and adding in the audio. Let me see, Orson Welles. And then we got to get going here. Orson Welles. Orson Welles. War of the Worlds. New York Times. Picture. Yes. You guys might damn well be right. Because that... Okay, that's the picture I have in my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I I I have freaked myself out here. Okay, hang on just a second. Let me bring this up here. Open image in new tab. Then we need to bring it over here to this browser. Yeah, wow. Okay, and it wasn't even RKO, it was CBS. All right. This is what I was this is what I was thinking. This picture here of, uh, of Orson Welles reading The War of the Worlds. Yeah, this is the image I had in my head when I was talking about this. I, I didn't see you say that 10 minutes ago. Sorry, Justin. I, I, did, I didn't catch that 10 minutes ago. Shit, super chat. Uh, yeah, see, I, and I had like an image of a round RKO radio microphone but this is this is it this is it with the suspenders as i was saying the rolled up sleeves yeah th that's what it was yep all right so i i freaked myself out my my brain my brain did this big amalgamation of things uh, well he was so young this was 1938 the brown pants i have no idea where they came from I, I have no, I, but this is literally the the image that I was thinking. Of. So yeah, mystery solved. It was just my brain sort of collecting all of the pre Tom Cruise War of the World shit and melding it together in my skull. So all right, there we go. <laughs> Problem solved, everybody. Chad is always yeah no Chad is awesome because it's just me spurging out of my mouth. Uh, real time versus all of you people, hundreds of you researching and doing things while I'm talking. And currently we have 265 people here and 298 likes. So thank you so much. But I know we've probably had a full turn, at least nearly, very nearly a full turnover of people. Oh, Jim Satal is doing, do, doing the Lord's work, correcting me here. Legal Vice is the picture of him in the brown suit is from the press conference after the broadcast with everyone screaming at him. Thank you. I'm not crazy. I'm just I'm just putting together a giant amalgamation of different scenes from this. So yeah, thank you so much, Chad. You, <laughs> American Dreamer, those lips. Saucy. Flux, I don't know what you're laughing at, but shut up. I love you, Flux. You are so awesome. I am so looking forward to going to Houston next week to hang out with Ozzy Overlaw, Chandler Remington, and Flux. Three people that I want to meet so, so much. Absolute great people. I am so excited to meet Flux and Chandler and Ozzy that I just, I just can't control myself. Uh, just Don, soulless ginger. All oh, gingers have soul. Rolling eyes. Ten bucks. <laughs> It's too late to super chat to tell me to, to read something from 15 minutes ago. It's too late, but <laughs> thank you so much, Just Don. Uh, Miss K. Griff, I'm not crazy. I'm just confused. Yeah, that's pretty much me. I wasn't crazy. I was just confused. What was the color of Moses's robe? Uh, that was red with the white and black stripes, if I recall correctly. <laughs> At least that's what I think Charlton Heston was wearing. Might have been some yellow in there. I'm not sure. Anyway. Enough of that. Let's get on to the, the grand finale, if you will. He said, this is some excerpts from the uh, Leopold and Loeb defense. The closing statements by Clarence Darrow. 
I'm not going to do them justice whatsoever uh, by replicating whatever this great man's voice may have sounded like. I just want you guys to hear some arguments against the death penalty. And like I said, I am pro-death penalty. It's dwindling ever, ever so slightly every time I talk about it. But to this point in my life, I know Steve Gosney's written a book about the death penalty arguments for and against, et cetera. We've had discussions here on my stream. He's had discussions on Flux's stream and other streams about this. But the, the single most impactful thing to me that has pushed me the closest to being against the death penalty is actually these arguments right here. The arguments that Clarence Darrow made in the Leopold and Loeb case. Um, I, I, the first time I read these was back in law school. And I've read these, are, these closing arguments in their entirety several times. And I showed a book on this stream last Wednesday called Ladies and Gentlemen of the Court. I believe, I believe it's called Ladies and Gentlemen. Something about Ladies and Gentlemen of the Court or something. Like that, where it's, it's great closing arguments. Um, unfortunately, it's in the other room and I can't grab it now. But the, that, that, they're also included there. In their entirety. Uh, Flux says, one more week until I get to give you a hug. I'm excited. D Hugs are in line forever. You know, I, I, I'm a hugger. Can't wait. It's going to be awesome. Can't wait to hook up there. It's going to be super, super cool. Um, right. So I'm not going to put these arguments up here. I'm just going to just going to give them. I'm just gonna just gonna read the arguments as best I can. Uh, but let's see. Let me let me show you what the cover. This was actually published again because there was so much interest in this case that they they published in a book these closing arguments. Uh, I don't know. I don't want to keep them up because I want my mug to be front and center because you're all here. You all want to see me. You don't want to see this other. Uh, here we go. This is attorney Clarence Darrow's plea for mercy and prosecutor Robert E. Crow's demand for the death penalty in the Loeb Leopold case, the crime of the century. And, uh, you know, this, this is it. And I said, I've gone through and like highlighted some of the parts that I want to read. Let me see if I can, if I can do this in any way that makes it, uh, you know, consumable. Because I, I want my face to be seen because, frankly, I'm, I'm more handsome than everybody else that has anything to do with this. Does, does this help? Let me see. Eh, I guess we can do it like this. If, if, you, want to, if you want to see what I'm reading, eh, why not? Let's do this. That way, uh, Kurt seems like a good hugger, too. I'm not going to hug Kurt. I'm, dude, like the bro, the bro hug, maybe. Chandler should read Darrow for you. Chandler should do a lot of things. Chandler is awesome. We love Chandler. And uh, I don't know. Oh, I will hug you, Larax. We'll do the bro hug. You know, the, 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 the thumb grab and the, like, two pats on the back. Definitely we'll do that. We're going to do the full-on hug. <laughs> uh, Chandler's here. Yeah, Branka says he wants to come to Matsuri. Well, let, that'd be fun. Uh, and Chandler, I was, on, uh, I was on Lincoln Kane stream before I went on meme copium stream before I came here. And just so you know, Chandler, Lincoln Kane thinks you're fine. Just in case you're wrong. He says, yeah. Chandler Remington, that Chandler Remington, she's she's quite a looker, isn't she? That's what Lincoln Kane had to say about you. We're gonna pull on slow dance. Don't deny our love. Now not that the Camelot's already spoken up for my my unrequited love. This is going to be silly. Montserrat is going to be silly. All right. Here we are. And, um, yeah. <clears throat> so I'm curious. We, you know, to, 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 to see what, to see if, uh, if, if, uh, Kurt from Uncivil Law agrees with my take on Clarence Darrow being one of, if not the OG greatest orator lawyers in the history of civilization. I say yes. And it will take a lot to convince me otherwise. Let's see, can we can we get this? Can we squeeze this whole thing in here? No, damn it! All right, so we'll we'll just read through some of the points that I highlighted in this. 
because it's such an amazing, amazing closing argument. The word pictures, the emotion that's behind these words is so, to me, powerful. I said, it's, it's so powerful, it almost convinces me to be against the death penalty. And mind you, this took place over 12 hours, so we certainly can't do the whole of it. We can't do it in its entirety. I'm a Paul Clement fan, but that is more of an appeal. Yeah, more on appeal. Yeah. Johnny Cochran is the greatest. He's good. He's a showman. He's got the showmanship down. All right, here we go. Uh, is it creepy if I, if I stalk Jeff through three different streams today? No, it shows that you are a smart, smart person. So, all right, let's do this. Closing arguments from October 22nd to 25th, 1924. Attorney Clarence Darrow's speech in the Franks case before Judge Cavalry in the criminal court of Cook County, Chicago. <clears throat> all right. Get the legal advice's reading voice on here. Here we go. <sighs> Mr. Darrow. It has been almost three months since I first assumed the great responsibility that has devolved upon me and my associates in this case, and I am willing to confess that it has been three months of perplexity and anxiety, a trouble for which I would gladly have spare, been spared, excepting for my feelings of affection towards some of the members of one of these families. It is a responsibility that is almost too great for anyone to assume that has devolved upon us. But we lawyers can do no more, we, but we lawyers can no more choose than the court can choose. And he's going to come back later and drop an amazing choice on the judge himself. It is a responsibility that is almost too great for anyone to assume that is devolved upon us, but we lawyers can no more choose than the courts can choose. Your Honor, our anxiety over this case has not been due to the facts that are connected with his, uh, with his most unfortunate affair, but to the almost unheard of publicity, to the fact that newspapers all over this country have been giving it space such as they have almost never given a case before. The fact that day after day, the people of Chicago have been regaled with stories of all sorts about it until almost every person has formed an opinion. And when the public is interested and want a punishment, no matter what that offense is, great or small, they only think of one punishment, and that is death. It may not be a question that involves the taking of human life. It may be a question of pure prejudice alone. But when the public speaks as one man, they only think of killing somebody. See, I like that. I like that very much. He's saying mob rules, mob mentality. One person alone would be very hesitant to condemn someone to death. But when you get a mob, when you get a group of people together, they're much more inclined to sentence someone to death. I, I love the way he puts that. When the public speaks as one man, when the group speaks, they only think of killing someone. I insist, Your Honor, that this has been the case of two boys of this age. And again, he's calling them boys because they were under the legal age of majority at that time. They were 18 and 19 years old, which made them minors at that time in history. And I insist, Your Honor, that this has been a case of two boys of this age, unconnected with families. Sorry, I have to move this on over here. I'm looking off to the side. Unconnected with families who are supposed to have great wealth. There is not a state's attorney in Illinois who would not at once have consented to a plea of guilty and a punishment in the penitentiary for life. Not one. No lawyer could have justified it. No prosecution could have justified it. So what he's saying is if these were normal people, the only reason you're seeking the death penalty is because these kids come from rich families. If they were just from unconnected families, if they were just from normal families, nobody would have been opposed to life in prison to these people if they came in here and pled guilty. If they said, yes, I did it, you know, I'm sorry, please have mercy, you would have sentenced them to life in prison without question. You wouldn't have sought the death penalty. You're only seeking the death penalty because they are from a rich family. 
this is something that he that that comes into play throughout this closing argument. So we could have come into this court without evidence, without argument, with nothing. And this court would have given to us what every judge in the city of Chicago has given to every boy in the city of Chicago since the first capital case was tried. And we would have had no contest. We are here with the lives of two boys imperiled, with the public aroused for what? Because, unfortunately, their parents have money. Nothing else. I told Your Honor in the beginning that never had there been a case in Chicago where on a plea of guilty, a boy under 21 had been sentenced to death. So this is the only the only two cases ever in the history of Chicago where the prosecution have sought, has sought death was for these two boys under 21 years of age. I will raise that age and say never has there been a case where a human being under the age of 28 or 30 has been sentenced to death. And I think that I am safe in saying, although I've not examined all the records and could not, but I think I'm safe in saying that never has there been such a case in the state of Illinois. And yet this court is urged, I threatened, that he must hang two boys contrary to the precedents, contrary to the acts of every judge who ever held court in this state. Why? Tell me what public necessity there is for this. So what's the public necessity for death? Why do you have to kill these two boys? Why need the state's attorney ask for something that was never asked before? Why need a judge be urged by every argument, moderate or immoderate, to hang two boys in the face of every precedent in Illinois and in the face of the progress of the last 50, at least 25 years? And he talks about children were only hanged in the dark ages. I have heard in the last six weeks nothing but the cry for blood. I have heard rays from the office of the state's attorney nothing but the breath of hate. I have heard precedents quoted, which would be a disgrace to a savage race. I've heard a court urged almost to the point of threats to hang two boys. In the face of science, in the face of philosophy, in the face of humanity, in the face of experience, in the face of all the better and more humane thought of the age. Now, Your Honor, I shall discuss that more in detail a little later, and I only say it now because, my friend, Mr. Savage, did you pick him for his name or his ability or his learning? I love that the, his opponent, Mr. Savage. <laughs> did you pick him because his name was Savage? I like that. That was a little dig there. That was a little Clarence Darrow dig. Uh, you, my friend, Mr. Savage, did you pick him for his name or his ability or his learning? Because my friend, Mr. Savage, is as savage a speech as he knew how to make said to this court that we pled guilty because we were afraid to do anything else. So yeah, he's a, he, they pled guilty because they were afraid to do anything else. Your Honor, that is true. That is true. I want to refer to one thing in passing. Then I will discuss this phase in the place where I think it belongs. He doesn't want the boys to be released. He agreed that they should be sent to jail for the rest of their life said, we're asking this court to save their lives, which is the least and the most that a judge can do. We did plead guilty before, Your Honor, because we were afraid to admit, to submit our case to a jury. He flat out admits, we were afraid to submit our case to a jury. I would not for a moment deny to this court or to this community a realization of the serious danger we were in and how perplexed we were before we took this most unusual step. I can tell your honor why. I found that years and experience with life tempers one's emotions and makes him more understanding of his fellow. When my friend Savage is my age or even yours, he will read his address to this court with horror. And then, Your Honor, it may not be hardly fair to the court, because I'm aware that I have helped to place a serious burden upon your shoulders, and that I have always meant to be your friend, but this was not an act of friendship. What he's doing is he is apologizing to the judge here, because he could have, he could have submitted this case to a jury and had the jury decide whether or not to submit his clients to the death penalty. 
he could have had the jury decide whether or not to sentence his clients to death. He did not do that. He did not go for the jury. He put this solely on the judge. And what he's saying here, he's apologizing the, to the judge for saying that the jury can't make the decision whether to send us to death. He's saying that it's the judge's decision. And what he says here is so powerful. It's so moving to the judge. The first thing he does is apologize to the judge. He said, I've always tried to be your friend, but this is not an act of friendship to do what I am doing to you now. And what is he doing to the judge? He said, I know perfectly well that where responsibility is divided by 12, it's easy to say away with him. So I know that if we give this to a jury of 12 people and ask them whether to sentence him to death, it's easy for 12 people to come together as a mob and say sentence him to death. I'm only one twelfth responsible for killing this person. See, it's easy for the jury to say, okay, I'm just one voice in 12. We can sentence him to death. I know perfectly well that where responsibility is divided by 12, it's easy to say away with him. But, Your Honor, if this is so fucking brutal to this judge. This is this is so powerful. But your honor, if these boys hang, you must do it. There can be no division of responsibility here. You must do it. You can never explain that the rest overpowered you. It must be your deliberate, cool, premeditated act without a chance to shift responsibility. That is a brutally powerful argument. He's saying, you know, the judge is not allowed to go, okay, it was 11 to one and I just eventually caved into all of the other people. He's saying, no judge, you are the only person, only you with your cool premeditated act, your deliberate act, without any chance of res- of shifting responsibility to anyone else. You are the sole person on planet Earth that has to take responsibility for sentencing these two children to death. That was a brutally genius, genius brilliant argument to make to the judge. Exactly. Tourette's Majestic says, this man is both awe-inspiring and dangerous with his words. Holy shit. Right. I mean, that's astounding. We did it, Your Honor. It's not a kindness to you. We placed this responsibility on your shoulders because we were mindful of the rights of our clients, and we were mindful of the unhappy families who have done no wrong. I mean, that's just brutal to tell the judge, nobody, you can't blame this on anyone else. You can't say I caved to pressure. You're the only one that can sentence these kids to death. Your honor will never thank me for unloading this responsibility upon you, but you know that I would have been untrue to my clients if I had not concluded to take this chance before a court, instead of submitting it to a poisoned jury in Chicago in the city of Chicago. Because again, he was saying that everybody in Chicago has heard this. It's been more publicized than any other case in the history of Chicago. So, and he's saying, so the jury is, a jury would be poisoned against them already. So rather than submitting it to a poisoned jury in the city of Chicago, I'm telling you, it's your responsibility. I did it knowing that it would be an unheard of thing for any court, no matter who, to sentence these boys to death. That's the challenge to the judge. I gave this responsibility to you because it's unheard of in the history of Chicago for any judge to sentence kids to death like this. So I did it knowing that it would be an unheard of thing for any court, no matter who, to sentence these boys to death. And that far, so far as that goes, and that far, so far as it goes, Mr. Savage is right. I hope, Your Honor, that I have made no mistake I could have wished that the state's attorney's office had met this case with the same fairness that we have met it. And, Your Honor, I must for a moment criticize the arguments that have preceded. I can read to you in a minute my friend Marshall's argument barring Blackstone, and I will simply call your attention to what he left out. 
But the rest of his arguments and the rest of his of Brother Savage's arguments, I can sum up in a minute. So he's gonna, the arguments for the death penalty are cruel, dastardly, premeditated, fiendish, abandoned, and malignant heart. That sounds like a cancer, cowardly and cold-blooded. Cowardly? Well, I don't know. Let me tell you something that I think is cowardly. This is the interesting thing. And from here for the next little while, he compares the judge's burden of sentencing these boys to death to the actions that Leopold and Loeb did when murdering this child. So he, he, he equates the judge murdering his clients to his clients murdering this boy. And it sounds ridiculous, but he does it so well. Is cowardly? Well, I don't know. Let me tell you something that I think is cowardly, whether their acts were or not. Here is Dickie Loeb, and they object to anybody calling him Dickie, although everybody did, but they think they can hang him easier if his name is Richard. They don't want me to call him Dickie because that makes him too familiar. Using the name Richard, it's easier to kill him. So we will call him Richard, 18 years old at the time. Here is Nathan Leopold Jr., 19. Here are three officers watching them. They are led out and in this jail across the bridge waiting to be hanged. Not a chance to get away. Handcuffed when they get out. Not a chance. Penned like a rat in a trap for some lawyer with physiological eloquence to wave his fist in front of his face and shout cowardly does not appeal to me as a brave act. It does not commend itself to me as a brave act or as a proper thing for a state's attorney or his assistant, for even defendants not yet hanged have some rights with an official. Cold-blooded? Uh, but I don't know, Your Honor. I will discuss that a little, a little later, whether it was cold-blooded or not. Cold-blooded, why? Because they planned and schemed and arranged and fixed. So he's saying, yeah, are you saying this was a cold-blooded Miller? A cold-blooded murder? Are you saying this was cold-blooded murder because they planned and schemed and arranged and fixed to kill this kid? Well, yes. It, it, it was a cold-blooded murder because they planned and schemed and fixed. But here are the officers of justice, so-called, with all the power of the state, with all of the influence of the press, to fan this community into a frenzy of hate with all of that who for months have been planning and scheming and contriving and working to take these two boys' lives. You may stand them upon a scaffold, on a trapdoor, and choke them to death, but that act would be infinitely more cold-blooded, whether it was justified or not, than any act these boys have committed or can commit. Cold-blooded, let the state, who is so anxious to take these boys' lives, set an example in consideration kind-heartedness and tenderness before they call my clients cold-blooded. So he's saying, that you know, the, yes, my clients may have committed a cold-blooded murder because they planned and schemed and arranged and fixed to kill this kid, but this is what the state has been doing since that time. They've been planning and scheming and arranging and fixing to try to kill these two boys. Before they call me and my clients cold-blooded, maybe they should stop being a little cold-blooded themselves. I never have, I, I have never yet tried a case where the state's attorney did not say it was the most cold blooded, inexcusable, premeditated case that ever occurred. And we see that. We see that with the YNW Melly trial, with Shib Business. It's, the, it's, you know, the prosecutor is always saying, yes, this is the most cold blooded. This is the most inexcusable. This is the, this is the most premeditated case that ever, that ever occurred. He's saying every prosecutor says that. Why do they why do the prosecutors say that every case they handle is the most is the worst case they've ever seen? If it was murder, there was never such a murder. If it was robbery, there was never such a robbery. If it was conspiracy, it was the most terrible conspiracy that ever happened since the Star Chamber passed into oblivion. If it was larceny, there never was such a larceny. So now I'm speaking moderately, all of them are the worst. Why? Well, it adds to the credit of the state's attorney to be connected with a big case. Every, every prosecutor wants to be involved in the, the worst murder, the biggest felony, the greatest larceny. Every prosecutor wants to have that. Look at Gravely in the Zachariah Anderson trial. He wants to be involved. He wants to be part of this great thing. So, uh, 
Now I'm speaking moderately. All of them are the worst. Why? Well, it adds to the credit of the state's attorney to be connected with a big case. That is one thing. They can say, well, I tried the cold bloodiest. Is that right? Cold bloodiest murder case that was ever tried. And I convicted them. And they're dead. Or I tried the worst forgery case that was ever tried. And I won that. I never did do anything that wasn't big. Lawyers are apt to say that anyhow. The 12 jurors, being good themselves, think it is a tribute to their virtue if they follow the litany of the state's attorney. Powerful, based statements there. I'm saying the jurors, they're inclined to follow the prosecutor. You get the prosecutor saying, ah, oh, this guy is, he's charged with the most heinous murders that have ever been convicted. And the jurors think they're good people. They think, oh, I'm doing a good thing if I agree with the prosecutor that these are the worst crimes that have ever been committed and we should sentence them to death. In other words, the, pro the jurors follow the prosecutor. Well, he was obviously arrested for something. Well, now let, let, let's see how we measure it. He's saying, like, how do we know this murder was cruel or exceedingly cruel? What's what? How do we determine that? You see, you're saying this is an exceedingly cruel murder. What do you use to reach this conclusion? Well, now let's see how we measure it. There ought to be some rule to determine whether a murder is cruel or not exceedingly cruel. In that way, they've got me beat at the start. But I would say the first thing to consider was the degree of pain to the victim. See, this wasn't a torture. They just killed the kid. It, sound, it sounds cold to say that, but it wasn't It wasn't a shit business thing where you choke him out and do all these horrible things. It wasn't a torture killing. It wasn't death by a thousand cuts. It wasn't, you know, torture porn where you, it's a, you know, the, consider the degree of the victim. Poor little Bobby Frank suffered very little. This is not an excuse for the killing, but he didn't suffer. They just kind of killed him. So if you... I mean, that's kind of a, that's an interesting argument to make. Because we're trying to find out what, what is a cruel murder? What is an, or, you know, what is an exceedingly cruel murder? What is a cruel murder? What is not exceedingly cruel? You saying just look at the degree of, of suffering of the victim. So poor little Bobby Frank suffered very little. It's not an excuse for the killing, but if to hang these two boys would bring them back to life. So if the hang Leopold in love would bring little uh, Bobby Franks back to life, I would say, let them go. And I believe their parents would say it. So he's saying, yeah, if, if killing these two kids could bring Bobby Franks back to life, go ahead, go ahead, do it. But the moving finger writes and having writ moves on, nor all of your piety, nor wit can lure it back to cancel half a line or change a word of it. Bobby Franks is dead, and we cannot change that. It was all over in 15 minutes after he got in the car, and he probably never knew it or thought of it. So that, that doesn't justify it. That's the last thing I'm going to do. I'm sorry for the poor boy. I'm sorry for his parents, but it's done. He's already dead, and he died a relatively painless death. So what's it going to do to, what's it going to serve to murder my two clients? This is a senseless useless, purposeless, motiveless act of two boys. He's admitting that it was pointless what they did. There was no, there was no reason for them to do it. Now, see, J.K. D. Buck, you're missing the point. He said, Darrow was full of it. Nobody thought the execution would bring their... That's what he's saying. He's saying, you don't know... You don't believe it would bring these kids back. He's saying, if it was, if it would bring them back, then fine, do it. But it's not... You know it's not going to bring them back. So why why kill them for killing somebody else? You know, you, you, you missed the point there, J.K. D. Buck, a little bit. That's exactly what he's saying. You know it won't bring them back. So killing my guys isn't going to solve anything. He knew what he was talking about. So you see, this is a senseless, useless, purposeless, motiveless act of murder by two boys. Now, let me see if I can prove it. There was not a particle of hate. There was not a grain of malice. There was not an opportunity to be cruel, except as death is cruel, and death is cruel. There was absolutely no purpose in it at all, no reason in it at all, and no motive in it at all. And yet, it was the most terrible crime that ever happened. 
Now, let me see whether I'm right or not. These two boys, neither one of whom needed a cent, scions of wealthy people, killed a little inoffensive boy to get $10,000. Because I was saying there's like a ransom for $10,000 or something. Uh, he said that these two young men were heavy gamblers and they needed money to pay gambling debts or on account of gambling. Now, Your Honor, he said this was atrocious, most atrocious, and they did it to get the money because they were gamblers and needed it to pay gambling debts. What did he prove? So what, what, what gambling debts did he prove? He put on one witness and only one who had played bridge with both of them in college, and he said they played for five cents a point. Now, I trust your honor knows better than I do how much a game that would be. At poker, I might, I might guess, but I do not know much about bridge, but what else? He said that in that game, one of them lost $90 to the other. They were playing against each other. They were playing against each other, and one of them lost $90? $90? Their joint money was just the same, and there is not another word of evidence in this case to sustain the statement of Mr. Crow, who pleads to hang these boys. So he's saying, you know, Mr. Crow is urging us to hang them because they did this for $90 worth of gambling debt. He said they were, these two murderers were playing against each other. One lost $90 to the other. They still have the same amount of money as when they started. That's a ridiculous argument. And there's no evidence to support this argument. He said, your honor, is it not trifling? Is it not trifling except that we, your honor, are dealing in human life? And all that they can get out of their imagination, talking about the prosecution, is that there was a game of bridge and one lost $90 to the other and therefore they go out and commit murder? Or on thunder, crow? <laughs> yeah, so he's saying, look, that's the best the prosecution can come up with. They, 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 these two guys committed murder because one lost $90 to the other? That's absurd. Said, your honor knows that it is utterly absurd. The evidence was absolutely worthless. The statement was made out of whole cloth, and Mr. Crow felt like that policeman who came in here and perjured himself, and I will show you later on, who said what he was talking with who said when he was talking with Nathan Leopold, he told him that the public were not satisfied with the motive. I wonder if the public is satisfied with this motive. If there is any person in Chicago who, under the evidence in this case, after listening to it or knowing it, would believe that this case, the motive, then he's just stupid. That's all I have to say for him. Just plain stupid. And then he goes like, they risked their neck for $5,000. Said even if they did uh, you know, demand ransom of $10,000, they only get $5,000 a piece. And that doesn't make sense because a few months before, Dickie Loeb had $3,000 in his checking account. And then he's like, okay. And uh, the other guy, he's getting ready to go on a tour of Europe and his father was going to give him $3,000 cash for his Europe tour. So it doesn't make sense. Your Honor, jurors sometimes make mistakes and courts do. If on this evidence, the court is to construe a motive out of this case, then I insist, Your Honor, that human liberty is not safe and that human life is not safe. A motive could be construed out of any set of circumstances and facts that might be imagined. In addition to Your Honor, these boys' families were wealthy, extremely wealthy. They'd been raised in luxury. They had never been denied anything nor want or desire left unsatisfied. No debts, no need of money, nothing. And yet they murdered a little boy against whom they had nothing in the world, without malice, without reason to get $5,000 a piece. All right, all right, Your Honor, if the court believes it, if anyone believes it, I can't help it. They talked about how the boys are mentally diseased. They, they have mental problems. Uh, the voice of the mom. Now let's see. I do not need to ask for mercy from this court, although I'm willing to do it for these clients, nor for anybody else, nor for myself. I have never yet found a person who did not need it. They say, I don't need to ask for mercy, but everybody asks for mercy. Everybody needs mercy. 
but I do not ask mercy for these boys. Your honor may be as strict in the enforcement of the law as you please, and you cannot hang these boys. You can only hang them because back of the law and back of justice and back of the common sense instincts of man and back of the human feeling for the young is the hoarse voice of the mob which says hang them. So you can't hang. The only way you can hang these people is if you listen to the mob that says hang these people. And now he goes into a discussion about the human condition and the human situation over history. There is neither cruelty to the deceased beyond taking his life, which is such, nor was there any depth of guilt and depravity on the part of the defendant, for it was a truly motiveless act without the slightest feeling of hatred or revenge done by a couple of children for no reason whatsoever. I uh, did talk about they stole a typewriter and that had nothing to do with the crime. And then he goes into the, the minds of the children, the minds of these two guys. Were these boys in their right minds? Let's see. Here were two boys with good intellect, 118, 119. They had all the prospects that life could hold out for any of the young. One a graduate of Chicago and another of Ann Arbor. One who had passed his examination for Harvard Law School and was about to take a trip to Europe. Another who had passed at Ann Arbor, the youngest in his class, with money in the bank. Boys who never knew what it was to want a dollar. Boys who could reach any position that was given to boys of that kind to reach. Boys of distinguished and honorable fellows, of families of wealth and position with all of the world before them. And they gave it all up for nothing. For nothing. They took a little companion of one of them on a crowded street and killed him for nothing and sacrificed everything that could be of value in human life upon the crazy scheme of a couple of immature lads. Now, Your Honor, you have been a boy. I have been a boy, and I am proud of having been a boy. And we have known other boys. The best way to understand someone else is to put ourselves in their place. It is within the realm of your imagination that a boy who was right with all the prospects of life before him who could have chosen what he would without the slightest reason in the world would lure a young companion to his death and take his place in the, sh in the shadows of the gallows. I don't care what Dr. Crone may say. He is liable to say anything except to tell the truth, and he is not liable to do that. This is There is nobody who has the process of reasoning who doesn't know that a boy would do that a boy would do that is not right. How insane he is, I care not. I care if he's insane. How, in how insane he is, I care not. Whether medically or legally, they did not reason. They didn't even think of it. It doesn't matter if they're crazy. They just didn't even think about this. They did not reason. They could not reason. They committed the foolishest, most unprovoked, most purposeless, most causeless act that any two boys ever committed. And they put themselves where the rope is dangling above their heads by their act. There are not physicians enough in the world if they all testified the same way to convince any thoughtful, fair-minded man that these two boys are right. Was their act one of, de of deliberation, intellectual formality, or were they driven by some force such as Dr. White or Dr. Gluck or Dr. Healy have told the court? There are only two theories. There are only two theories. One is that their diseased brains drove them to it, the other is the old theory of possession by devils. And my friend Marshall could have read you books on that too, but this has been pretty well given up in Illinois. Why did, why did they kill little Bobby Franks? Not for money, not for spite, not for hate. They killed him as they might kill a spider or a fly. The experience. They killed him because they were made that. Because somewhere in the infinite processes that go into the making up of the boy or the man, something slipped. And these unfortunate lads sit here hated, despised, outcasts, and the community shouting for their blood. Are they to blame for it? There's not any man on earth can mention any purpose for it at all or any reason for it. It is one of those things that happened, and it calls not for hate, but for kindness, for charity, for consideration. 
But I'm thinking of the mothers too. I know that any mother might be the mother of little Bobby Franks, who left his home, went to his school, and whose life was taken, and who never came back. I know that any mother might be the mother of Richard Loeb and Nathan Leopold just the same. The trouble is this, that if she is the mother of a Nathan Leopold or a Richard Loeb, she has to ask herself this question. How came my children to be what they are? From what ancestry did they get this strain? How far removed was the poison that destroyed their lives? Was I the bearer of seed that brings them to death? God, that is beautiful language. That is, that is gorgeous, beautiful, power language, powerful language. Put, your, put yourself in the minds of the mothers of these two kids. What did I do wrong? Where did they get this? Where did, where did this, I mean, he could say, you know, you know where, where did this come from? He doesn't say, where did this come from? He says, from what ancestry did they get this strain? How far removed was that poison that destroyed, destroyed their life? Was I the bearer of the seed that brings them death? That is a beautiful use of language. I do not know what it was, what it was made these boys do this mad act. But I do know there is a reason for it. He said, I don't know why they did it, but I know there's a reason. I know they did not beget themselves. They didn't give birth to themselves. I know that any one of an infinite number of causes reaching back to the beginning might be working out in these boys' minds, whom you're asking to hang in malice and in hatred and in justice because someone in the past has sinned against them. This is the nature versus nurture argument. He's saying something made these kids this way. And you're, you want to hang them? You want to kill them? You want to put them to death? because of the results of something that happened much earlier in their life? They somehow learned this. They somehow became this, and you want to kill them for it. This, this section, justice calls for mercy. This is interesting. And do you think that you can cure it by hanging these two? That's a great question. And do you think you can cure it by hanging these two? Do you think you can cure the hatreds and the maladjustments of the world by hanging them? You simply show your ignorance and your hate when you say it. What is my friend's idea of justice? He says to this court, whom he says he represents, I'm talking about the prosecution here, you know, the, the prosecutor says, and I believe he does, Your Honor, who sits here patiently holding the lives of these two boys in their hands, give them the same mercy that they gave Bobby Franks. That's the eye for an eye argument. Well. They killed him, we'll kill him too. You give them the same mercy that they gave to Bobby Franks. That's the eye for an eye argument. Saying the prosecution is saying, I give an eye for an eye. Uh, you know, do 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 to them what they did to Bobby Franks. So is that the law? Is that justice? Is that what a court should do? Is that what a state's attorney should do? For God's sake, if the state in which I live is not kinder, more human, more considerate, more intelligent than the mad act of these two mad boys, I'm sorry I've lived so long. That to me right there is one of the most powerful statements in this whole thing. Saying, yeah, eye for an eye. People say, oh, you know, they deserve it. They did this, so they, they killed the boy, so they need to be killed too. Saying, if you're not, you want to kill, they killed this boy and you want to kill them. So you're the same as these two boys. If you're not better than these two boys, I'm sorry I've lived this long. That's not the law. Eye for an eye is not the law. That's not justice. I mean, in, in all 60 some odd pages of his test, this is one of the most powerful, powerful paragraphs to me. And this is one that pushes me closer to the anti-death penalty state. If we're not better than the killers, I'm sorry I've lived this long. That's powerful. You want to they killed somebody, so you want to kill them? You're you're on the same level as them. If you're not better than the people you're trying to, if you, you're trying to kill them and they killed somebody, so if you're not better than them, then I'm sorry. So yeah. Is that the law? Is that justice? 
Is that what a court should do? Is this what a state's attorney should do? For God's sake, if the state in which I live is not kinder, more humane, more considerate, more intelligent than the mad act of these two mad boys, I'm sorry I have lived so long. Then they go into a big litany about the crimes. Uh, and then he's talking about the medical treatment. I say again, whatever madness and hate and frenzy may do to the human mind, there's not a single person who reasons who can believe that one of these acts was the act of a man of brains that were not diseased. This is the, clearly they were crazy because only crazy people would do what they did argument. How do I know they were crazy? Because they did crazy shit. Nobody would look at this and say, this is the act of a rational human being. Nobody would look at this and say, this wasn't because of some diseased mind. There is no other explanation for it. And had it not been for the wealth and the weirdness and the notoriety, they would have been sent to the psychiatric hospital for examination, the psychopathic hospital for examination, and been taken care of instead of demanding that this court take the last pound of flesh and the last drop of blood from two irresponsible lads. So you're saying you, that clearly they're crazy because they did crazy shit. And if it was anybody else other than a rich family, if it was a rando off the street, you would have taken them to the psycho ward and you would have cared for them and taken care of them for the rest of their lives rather than demanding they be put to death. Maniac plans, and idiot plans, and animal plans, any brain that functions may plan, but their plans were diseased plans of a diseased mind of boys. Do I need to argue it? Does anybody need to more than glance at it? Is there any man with a fair intellect and a decent regard for human life and the slightest bit of heart that doesn't understand this situation? He's like... The, any, anybody can plan anything. It's clear these kids were diseased in their mind. No, nobody can question the fact that these kids were messed up. But do we need to kill them? What do they want? Tell me. Is a lifetime for the young spent behind prison bars, is that not enough for this mad act? And is there any reason why this great public should be regaled by a hanging? I can't understand it, Your Honor. It would be past belief. Accepting that to the four corners of the earth, the news of this weird thing has been carried, and men have been stirred, and the primitive has come back, and the intellect has been destroyed. And so if you want to kill these people for this, we're going back to the origins of man. We're going back to the barbaric times. Your intellect has been destroyed, and you're going back to the animal retribution stage of human history. That's what he's arguing. And this next, I like the heading for this next section the death penalty is more shocking than the crime. My friend Savage pictured to you the putting of this dead boy in this culvert. Well, no one can minutely describe any killing and not make it shocking. It is shocking. So it's like, yeah, any killing, no matter how. You know, just boring and dull it is. If you get into the minutia, it's shocking. It is shocking. And it is shocking because we love life and because we instinctively draw back from death. It is shocking if death comes to a home, if it comes to a hospital. It is shocking wherever it is and however it is. And perhaps it's almost equally, always almost equally shocking. But here is the picture of a dead boy. He's past pain. No harm can come to him. Put in a culvert after taking off his clothes so the evidence can be destroyed. And that is pictured to this court as a reason for hanging. I could say something about the death that for some mysterious reason the state wants in this case. Why do they want it? Why do they want death? Why do they want to sentence these two kids to death? I don't know. To vindicate the law? I don't know. The law can be vindicated without killing anyone else. It might shock the fine sensibilities of the state's counsel that this boy was put into a culvert and left after he was dead. But, Your Honor, I can think of a scene that makes this pale into insignificance. This is, this is a, an interesting, powerful argument. Saying, yeah, it's horrible that this kid was murdered 
and put into a culvert. But I'm going to tell you something that makes killing a boy and putting him into a culvert pale into insignificance. I'm going to tell you something worse than that. I can think and only think, Your Honor, of taking two boys, one 18 and the other 19, irresponsible, weak, diseased, pinning them in a cell, checking off the days and the hours and the minutes until they'll be taken out and hanged. Wouldn't it be a glorious day for Chicago? Wouldn't it be a glorious triumph for the state's attorney? Wouldn't it be a glorious triumph for the justice in this land? Wouldn't it be a glorious illustration of Christianity and kindness and charity to murder these kids? I can picture them weakened in the gray light of morning, furnished a suit of clothes by the state, led to the scaffold, their feet tied, a black cap drawn over their heads, placed on a trap door, and somebody pressing a spring so that it falls under them, and they are only stopped by the rope around their necks. It would surely expiate the placing of young Franks after he was dead into the culvert. That would bring immense satisfaction to the people. It brings a greater satisfaction because it's done in the name of justice. That's sarcasm. That's sarcasm. Wouldn't killing these kids be the glorious illustration of Christianity and kindness and charity? I am always suspicious of righteous indignation. Nothing is more cruel than righteous indignation. It's not so much mercy either, Your Honor. I can hardly understand myself pleading to a court to visit mercy on two boys by shutting them in a prison for life. For life, where is the human heart that would not be satisfied with that? You're going to take two 18-year-old boys and put them in jail for the rest of their life. Why isn't that satisfactory? What, you know, why, what, what human heart wouldn't be satisfied by locking them up in jail for the rest of their lives? That's what he's arguing there. And I must ask that these boys get mercy by spending the rest of their lives in prison. Year following year, month following month, day following day, with nothing to look forward to but hostile guards and stone walls. It ought not to be hard to get that much mercy in any court in the year 1924. And then talk about... You know, Pleas of guilty mean a lighter sentence. This is where he's going to go into the argument that everyone else that ever pleads guilty gets a lighter sentence than if they had been taken to trial. You plead guilty to get a lesser sentence. You, you plead guilty to get some sort of concession given to you. That's, that's what he's going to be arguing in this next session. And then lenience is shown in, in other cases... In other similar cases, they haven't sought the death penalty. In other cases, there's been leniency shown by the courts. If crimes decrease, the sentences are modified. This is an interesting thing. And he mentioned this before. That uh, England, it, it, we watched in the video, we're saying like England murders <laughs> or, or sentences kids to death, sentences people to death. Wow. I've become biased during the course of reading this. The death penalty in the U.S. is enforced five times more than in England. That was his argument. He said, what did they find in England? That as they got rid of these barbarous statute, crimes decreased instead of increased. So he's saying the death penalty doesn't decrease crimes. It increases it. And as you get rid of these barbarous punishments like death, crime actually drops. That as they got rid of these barbarous statutes, crimes decreased instead of increased. And as the criminal law was modified and humanized, there was less crime instead of more. I will undertake to say to your honor that you can scarcely find a single book written by a student, and I will include all the works on criminology of the past that has not made the statement over and over again that as penal code was made less terrible, crimes grew less frequent. I'm not pleading so much for these boys as I am for the infinite number of others to follow. Those who perhaps cannot be as well defended as they have been. Those who may go down in the storm and the tempest without aid. It is for them, it is of them I am thinking, and for them I am begging this court not to turn backward towards the barbarous and cruel past. Be more progressive, 
don't kill these kids. Don't don't commit murder on these children. Sentence them to jail for the rest of their lives. And these boys could not tell could tell this gruesome story without a change of countenance, which we like we saw in Taylor's business didn't change her countenance at all. These boys could tell this gruesome story without a change of countenance, without the slightest feelings. There were no emotional reaction to it. And why haven't they? I don't know. How can I tell why? You're saying they're, they're just damaged kids. Alienists. Alienists were the uh, early psychologists. They called them alienists. Back then. Uh, these boys, I do not care what their mind is. That simply makes it worse. They're emotionally defective. Every single alienist who testifies in this case has said so. The only person who did not was Dr. Crone. Again, we, we saw that in Taylor's Business. There was only one witness that said she wasn't crazy, and that was the witness uh, that was paid by the defense. But this is the exact opposite. Everyone else is saying they're crazy, but there's only one doctor saying they weren't crazy. While I'm, while I'm on that subject, lest I forget the eminent doctor, I want to refer to one or two things. In the first place, all of these alienists that the state called came in and heard them tell their story of this crime, and that's all they heard, nothing else. They just heard the story of the crime. We get to, there, there was a lot of this, oh, yeah, they would have grown up, they would have done this. You know, they, they, they listened to a lot of detective stories, but then they wanted to commit the perfect crime. That was one of the things. They just thought they were above everybody. They thought they were the Nietzschean Ubermensch, the Superman. They, they had a right to kill. They had a right to experience these things. And uh, where did this come from? Let's... Youth does things blindly. Suppose, Your Honor, that instead of this boy being here in this court under request of this court, that he that he pronounce a sentence to hang him by the neck until dead. So, okay, instead of being here and facing the death penalty, he'd been taken to a pathological hospital to be analyzed. And the physicians had inquired into it. What would they have said? What would they have said? There is only one thing that could possibly have said. They would have traced it all back to the gradual growth of the child. That's not all there is to it, Your Honor. Youth is hard enough. The only good thing about youth is that it has no thought and no care and how blindly we can do things when we are young. Where is the man who has not committed a crime in his youth? Let us be honest with ourselves. Let us look into our own hearts. How many men today, lawyers and congressmen and judges and even state's attorneys who have not done something when they were young? And if they did not get caught, or it was trivial, it was their good fortune, wasn't it? We might as well be honest with ourselves, Your Honor. Before I would tie a noose around the neck of a boy, I would try to call back into my mind the emotions of youth. I would try to remember what the world looked like to me when I was a child. I would try to remember how strong were these in instinctive, persistent emotions that moved my life. I would try to remember how weak and inefficient was youth in the presence of surging, controlling feelings of the child. One that remembers it and honestly remembers it and asks himself the question and tries to unlock the door that he thinks is closed and calls back the boy. He can understand the boy. I go back to damaged ancestors. And then he get, they get in... Talk about how they were they were consumed by by Nietzsche's philosophy. They bring that up a lot. Yeah, Nietzsche's philosophy had tremendous influence. This whole Ubermensch, where you know the superior race, the superior people, they got caught up in that. There's a lot of testimony to that effect. These boys, neither one of them could possibly have committed this act except by joining. That's another interesting thing. One person alone probably wouldn't have done this. But you get the two people that they convince each other, they agree with each other, they egg each other on to do this. Say, these boys, neither one of them could possibly have committed this act except by joining. It was not the act of one, it was the act of two. It was the act of their planning, their conniving, their believing in each other, their thinking themselves supermen. Without it, they could not have done it. It would not have happened. Your Honor, I am sorry for poor Bobby Franks. And I think that anybody who knows me knows that I'm not saying it simply to speak. I'm sorry for the bereaved father and the bereaved mother. And I would like to know what they would do with these poor unfortunate lads who are here in court today. I know something of them, of their lives, of their charity and their ideas, and nobody here sympathizes with them more than I. 
on the 21st day of May, poor Bobby Franks, stripped and naked, was left in a culvert down near the Indiana line. I know it came through the mad acts of mad boards. Mr. Savage told us that Franks, if he had lived, would have been a great man and accomplished much. I would leave this thought with your honor before lunch. I do not know what Bobby Franks would have been had he grown to be a man. Because we don't know what the defend, what, what the victim would have become. Maybe he would have been a great guy. Maybe he would have sucked. Do I don't know. I don't know what Bobby Franks would have would have been had he grown to a man. I don't know the laws that controls one's growth. Sometimes, Your Honor, a boy of great promise is cut off in his early youth. Sometimes he dies and is placed in a culvert. Sometimes a boy of great promise stands on a trap door and is hanged by the neck until he's dead. Sometimes he dies of diphtheria. Death somehow pays no attention to age, sex, prospects, or wealth. He's making the fate argument. Maybe it was just this kid's time. Maybe it was just fate. Maybe it was just his time to go. Perhaps somewhere in fate and chance, it might be that he lived as long as he should. And what I want to say is this, that the death of poor little Bobby Franks should not be in vain. Would it mean anything if on account of that death, these two boys were taken out and a rope tied around their necks and they died felons and left a blot upon the names of their families? Would that show that Bobby Franks had a purpose in his life and a purpose in his death? No. I say this, Your Honor, that the unfortunate and tragic death of this weak young lad should mean something. It should mean something. It should mean an appeal to the fathers and the mothers, an appeal to the teachers, to the religious guides, to society at large. It should mean an appeal to all of them to appraise their children, to understand the emotions that control them, to understand the ideas that possess them, to teach them to dodge the pitfalls of life. It should be to the millions of mothers who have read this case and the millions of fathers who have read it and the brothers and sisters who have read it that the death of Bobby Franks will teach them to examine their own children, their own families and their own brothers and their own sisters to see what is in them and what may be in them and what may be avoided to prevent future tragedies like, tragedies like this. That's an interesting statement as well. What does it mean if we kill these kids? What lesson are we to get from this? The lesson isn't to kill these kids. The lesson is to go pay attention to your children. Look at them. Look what they're, this is the, this is what we're talking about today, 90 years later. God, nine, it's a hundred years. This was 1924. A hundred years later, we're talking about the same things. Look at your kid. What are you, pay attention to your children. That's the lesson we need to get from this, not to kill people because they killed someone else. It's find out what your children, what is leading your children to have these thoughts? What is possessing your children to want to go out and needlessly kill other people? Pay attention to your families. That's what he's arguing here. This is the lesson we should get from this. That's a powerful statement. They had a weird, almost impossible relationship. Leopold, with his idea of the Superman, he repeatedly said that Loeb was his ideal of a Superman. He had the attitude towards him that one has to his most devoted friend or that a man has to a lover. Without the combination of these two, nothing of this sort probably could have happened. Watch your friends. Who are they hanging out? Pay attention to who your children are spending their times with. Make sure that you're, you know what's going on in their hearts. Brilliant argument. That's a brilliant argument. Give this kid's death some meaning. Do you tell me that this was the act of a normal boy? Of a boy who thinks and feels as a boy should? Back to the, he's, he's obviously crazy because he did something crazy. Does, do, do you tell me that this was the act of a normal boy, of a boy who thinks and feels as a boy should, who has the thoughts and emotions and physical life that boys should have? There is not a thing in all of it that corresponds with normal life. There's nothing about this situation that's normal. There's a weird, strange, unnatural disease in all of it, which is responsible for this deed. Now, Your Honor, I shall pass that subject.
I guess we're, yeah, we're in the seventies. We're almost done here. <laughs> now, your honor, I shall pass that subject. I think all of the facts of this extraordinary case, all of the testimony of these aliens that all that your honor has seen and heard, all of their friends and acquaintances who have come here to enlighten this court. I think all of it shows that this terrible act was the act of immature and diseased brains, the act of children. Nobody could explain it in any other way. No one could imagine it in any other way. It's not possible. It could have happened in any other way. And I submit, your honor, that by every law of humanity, by every law of justice, by every feeling of righteousness, by every instinct of pity, mercy, and charity to boys like these, your honor should say that because of the conditions of these boys, the condition of their minds, all of this should not be visited upon them with vengeance that is asked by the state. Hanging was meant for exhibition only to once in England, they hanged children seven years of age and not necessarily hang them because hanging was never meant for punishment. It was meant for an exhibition. If somebody committed a crime, he would be hanged by the head or the heels. It didn't matter which way. Yes, but hanged. hanging was an exhibition. They were hanged on the highest hill and hanged at the crossways and hanged in public places so all men could see. If there is any virtue in hanging, that is the way to do it because you cannot awe men into goodness unless they know about the hanging. We have not grown better than the ancients. Again, that's powerful. That's a powerful anti-death penalty argument there. Hanging was just solely for the public spectacle of it. It doesn't matter if you hang them head first or feet first. It doesn't work. No, you have to be awed by the fact, by the spectacle of people hanging. So that's what they did in the dark ages, and we're still doing it now. We have not grown better than the ancients. We, that's power. We haven't found a better way of dealing with this than doing what they were doing back in the dark ages. We have grown more squeamish. We do not like to look at it. That's all. They hang them at seven. They hang them at 11 and 14. As I remember it, we have gotten the law in Illinois up to 16. Anyhow, we've got it up to 14. In some states in the union, they raised it to 21, and we have raised it. We've raised it by the humanity of courts, by the understanding of courts, by the progress of science, which at last is reaching the law. And in 90 men hanged in Illinois, in 90 men hanged in Illinois from the beginning, not one single person under 24 was ever hanged upon a plea of guilty. Not one. You're trying to kill an 18-year-old boy and a 19-year-old boy. And never in the history of Illinois has anyone under the, 20, under the age of 24 who pled guilty been hanged. Never. Your Honor, what excuse could you possibly have? So remember, earlier on, he put this on the judge. He said, Judge, this is your cold, premeditated act. You, not the jury. You can't blame this on the jury. You can't claim pressure from anybody else. This is your own intentional cold act to kill these boys. Remember they said that earlier. Your Honor, what excuse could you possibly have for putting these boys to death? You would have to turn your back on every precedent of the past. Because remember, nobody under 24 that's pled guilty has ever been executed in Illinois. You would have to turn your back on every precedent of the past. You would have to turn your back on the progress of the world. You would have to ignore all human sentiment and feeling of which I know the court is full. You would have to do all of this if you would hang boys of 18 and 19 years of age who have come into this court and thrown themselves upon your mercy. I might do it, but I would want good reason for it which does not exist and cannot exist in this case, unless publicly worked up feeling, strong feeling, mad hate is the reason. And I know it's not. It is due to the cruelty that has paralyzed the hearts of young men growing out of the war. We are used to, we are, we'll talk about this. We are used to blood, your honor. It used to look mussy and make us feel squeamish. 
This is another strong, powerful argument. This is just after the end of World War I, the Great War, the war to end all wars, we thought. Now he's making the argument that the war has made life cheap. World War I has cheapened life. So now think about this. Think about this in the in the realm of you have just as a, a matter of years, just a couple of years, come out of the worst war in human history, the war you thought was so fucked up, there would never be another war after this. He says it's due to the cruelty that has paralyzed the hearts of men growing out of the war. They did this because of the war. We're used to blood, Your Honor. It used to look mussy and make us feel squeamish, but we've not only had it shed in buckets full, we have shed in rivers, lakes, and oceans, and we have delighted in it. We have preached it. We have worked for it. We have advised it. We have been ta we have taught it to the young, encouraged the old, until the world has been drenched in blood, and it has left its stains of blood upon every human heart and upon every human mind, and has almost stifled the feelings of pity and charity and humanity that have a natural home in the human heart. No, he's not, see, don't get this wrong, he's not blaming, we have Garrett Pace here, he'll blame rock and roll video games next. No, he's not blaming the war for what they did. He's blaming the war and our our our, our familiarity and our, our lust for blood on the desire to execute these children. He's not saying the, they did it because they were, they were, you know, calloused and cold because of the war. He's laying the effect of the war at the feet of the people that are calling for the death penalty. He's saying that the war has, has made your hearts cold and callous to murdering these defendants. Not, not that the defendants used the war as an excuse to commit the kid, saying, you know, we've delighted in blood so much, it's left stains upon our soul, and we're, we're calling for the death penalty because now death and blood and murder doesn't mean anything. It's it's nothing off your it's it it does nothing it takes no soul searching it it means nothing for people nowadays to to put people to death because they've been so enamored by blood they've been so enthralled with blood and they've learned blood their whole life that killing two two more boys means nothing to them that's the argument that he's making the argument for the war is directed at the people who want him to be sentenced to death. So again, but we have not only laid, we have not only had it shed in bucketfuls, we have had it shed in rivers, lakes, and oceans, and we have delighted in it. We have preached in it. We have worked for it. We've advised, and it is death. We've delighted in death. We've preached death. We've worked for death. We've advised death. We have taught death to the young, encouraged the old until the world has been drenched in blood and it has left its stains of blood upon every human heart and upon every human mind and has almost stifled the feelings of pity and charity and humanity that have natural homes in their hearts. And because of this, you want to kill these two boys. I think that is incredibly powerful. Your Honor... And again, hanging boys would be turning back to barbarism. We go back to this, the ancients were doing it. This was going on in the Dark Ages. Aren't we better than this? Your Honor, if in this court, a boy of 18 and a boy of 19 should be hanged on a plea of guilty in violation of every precedent in the past, because remember, nobody, nobody their age who's confessed to a crime has ever been hung. Your Honor, if, if in this court a boy of 18 and a boy of 19 should be hanged on a plea of guilty in violation of every precedent of the past, in violation of the policy of the law to take care of the young, in violation of all the progress that has been made and the humanity that has been used in the care of the young, in violation of the policy of placing boys in reformatories instead of prison, if Your Honor, in violation of all that, and in the face of all the past should stand out here in Chicago alone to hang a boy, then we are turning our faces backwards toward the barbarism which once possessed this world. 
if your honor can hang a boy of 18, some other judge can hang him at 17 or 16 or 14. Almost, we're almost done here. Hey, your honor, I have spoken about the war. I believed in it. I don't know whether I was crazy or not. Sometimes I think perhaps I was. I approved of it. I joined the general cry of madness and despair. I urged men to fight. I was safe because I was too old to go. I was like the rest. What did they do? Right or wrong, justifiable or unjustifiable, which I need not discuss today. It changed the world. For four long years, the civilized engaged in killing men. Christian against Christian, barbarians uniting with Christians to kill Christians, anything to kill. It was taught in every school, I in the Sunday school. The little children played at war, the toddling children on the street. Do you suppose this world has ever been the same since? How long, your honor, will it take for the world to get back in its human emotions to where it stood before the war? How long will it take the calloused heart of man before the scars of hatred and cruelty? Should be removed. We read of killing 100,000 in a day. Probably exaggerated, but what of it? We read about it and we rejoiced in it. It was the other fellows who were killed. We were fed on flesh and drank blood, even down to the prattling babe. I need not tell your honor this because you know. I need not tell you how many upright, honorable young boys have come into this court charged with murder, some saved and some sent to their death, boys who fought in this war and learned to place a cheap value on human life. Now he's talking about the, the uh, boys, the guilty boys. You know and I know it. These boys were brought up in it. The tales of death were in their homes, their playgrounds, their schools. They were in the newspapers that they read. It was part of the common frenzy. What was a life? It was nothing. It was the least sacred thing in existence, and these boys were trained into this cruelty. It will take 50 years at least to wipe out of the human heart, if ever. I know this. I have studied those things, that after the Civil War in 1865, crimes of this sort increased, marvelously increased. No one needs to tell me that crime has no cause. It has a definite cause, as any other disease. And I know that out of the hatred and bitterness of the Civil War, crime increased as America had never known it before. I know that growing out of the Napoleonic Wars, there was an era of crime such as Europe has never seen before. I know that Europe is going through it today. I know it has followed every war. And I know it has influenced these boys so that blood was not the same blood to them that it would have been if the world had not been bathed in blood. So human life was cheap for these boys because of the war. I do not know how much salvage there is in these two boys. I hate to say it in their presence, but what is there to look forward to? I do not know, but what your honor would be merciful if he tied a rope around their necks and let them die. Maybe it's merciful to kill them. I don't know. I don't know, but what your honor would be merciful if you took a rope around their necks and let them die. Merciful to them, but not merciful to civilization and merciful to those who would be left behind. I do not know to spend the balance of their days in prison is, is mighty little to look forward to, if anything. Is it anything? The easy thing and the popular thing to do is to hang my clients. I know it. Men and women who do not think will applaud. The cruel and the thoughtless will approve. I know your honor stands between the future and the past. I know the future is with me and what I stand for here. Not merely for the lives of these two unfortunate lads, but for all boys and girls all of the young, as far as possible, for all of the old. I'm pleading for life, understanding, charity, and kindness, and the infinite mercy that forgives all. I am pleading that we overcome cruelty and kindness and hatred with love. I know the future is on my side. Your honor stands between the past and the future. You may hang these boys. You may hang them by the neck till they're dead. But in doing so, you will turn your face toward the past. In doing it, you are making it harder for every other boy. In doing it, you're making it harder for unborn children. You may save them, and it makes it easier for every child that sometime may sit where these boys sit. It makes it easier for every human being with an aspiration and a vision and a hope 
and the fate if I should succeed in saving these boys' lives and do nothing for the progress of law, I should feel sad indeed. If I can succeed, my greatest reward and my greatest hope and my greatest compassionate compensation will be that I have done something for the tens of thousands of other boys, for the other unfortunate who must tread the same way that these poor youths have trod, that I have done something to help human understanding, to temper justice with mercy, to overcome with hate and love. I can end with no better quote. What he said, this is Omar Khayyam, so, it, so I be written in the book of love. I do not care about that book above. Erase my name or write it as you will. So I be written in the book of love. There you go. <clears throat> that was Clarence Darrow. A very, very brief excerpt from a 12-hour closing argument in the Leopold and Loeb case. And uh, at the end of that, as I mentioned, the judge was visibly weeping. He was in tears. He was brought to tears and weeping openly at the end of Clarence Darrow's statement. And they were sentenced to life plus 99 years. One was murdered in prison. One eventually got out in 1958. There we go. I, I hope that from that, that reading and, and watching Clarence Darrow earlier and that reading that we just gave, that lengthy, lengthy reading, of just a small portion of his closing arguments. You can see why I think that Clarence Darrow is one of the greatest orators that's ever lived and one of the greatest lawyers that's ever lived. And that's what we're here to do, to, just to share my love for the, for, for the way that Clarence Darrow was, for, for the language he used, for for the, 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 this, this gift that he was given and used. I mean, wh whether you agree with his arguments or not, the language he used was absolutely astounding. We don't have lawyers like that anymore. Is it F. Lee Bailey, Jerry Spence, Clarence Darrow? That's about it. And Jerry Spence is the only one of those three left, and he's 94. We're about to lose this. I mean, just listen to those arguments. Listen to the wording. Listen to the passion. Listen, listen to the language. And then go watch the YNW Melly closings. Go watch the Ship Business Defense closings. Go watch, you know, the Murdoch closings. We don't have that. It's not there. The passion, the emotion, the language pictures, just, just the beauty of language isn't present anymore. Like I say, it, it goes beyond whether you agree with what he's saying or not. It's, it's what makes him who he was. And we got a few super chats here. Then we're going to wrap this up. Just Don sold as ginger. We did your little, your little roll eye rolling thing here. And American Dreamer trying to get my son to go to Matsuri to get your autograph. What day is best? Appreciate you, Jeff. Uh, God dang. Uh, any day, I guess. Um, hell, send me a send me a tweet or an email. Twitter at the you know, the the legal vices on Twitter and the legal vices at gmail dot com. Send send me something. You know, like give me your address or whatnot, and I'll think of it. You know, I'll send you. And if you live in Houston, cool. If you're going driving halfway across the universe just to get my hell email, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll sign something for your kid. And that's I mean, that's that would be a, a privilege to do. But to, as far as I have no plans, I have no idea what's going on. Uh, I would hate to have you go all that way and not be able to hook up because I don't have phone access or I'm not paying attention or something. But you talk, talk send me send me a, a, a message on Twitter, the legal vices, or an email at the legal vices at gmail.com. We'll talk some more. 
I'll be there from the 10th to the 13th. I don't know where I will be or what I'll be doing at any given time. Uh, so yeah, hit, hit me up privately and we'll, we'll work something. out. Bass, that $90 covered every square inch of that room. Yeah. <laughs> You know, talking about their, the, the, the debt that they were, there was allegedly the motivation. Lesson learned, says Bass also, only be naked in a woman's culvert. I think you missed the lesson. <laughs> All right, people. Um, I have to head on over to Laid Back News with Eric Hunley and, and others. Uh, I'm a bit late. We went an hour over time. I, I knew I had highlighted a lot of that argument. That was that was the least I could bring out from that argument. And I thank you for all for all for 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 bearing with me as as I read through that. I just wanted, to, like I said, I want for the last few days I wanted to share my love of Effley Bailey, Jerry Spence, and the OG himself, Clarence Darrow. Thank you, thank you for thank you for hanging out with me. I desperately need a, a glass of water. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. We, you know, we, we might, we might do some more Clarence Darrow readings in the future. I know I've got, a, I've got a few of his closing arguments. Um, let's see where we go. Thank you, everyone. I really, really appreciate you being here. I appreciate your support. Uh, mods, you're great. Chat, you're great. Legal Vices chat, the Vice Squad, top notch, best around. Thank you very much, so much for your support as well. Um, let me get this set up so we can feed directly over to laid back news where you can watch more of me because I know that's what you're all about. Uh, all right. Let me, let me see here. I'm bringing this up. Mm -mm -mm -mm. My voice is just about shot to hell. <laughs> Looks like they got a full panel over there. Oh, I'll be over there in a minute, guys. All right. Need to go to my, my uh, studio. We'll be we'll be done here in about two minutes. Hang on, real tight. How did I lose three subscribers during that? Fuck you guys. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, live. I'm gonna go live. The live stream we got going right now. Go to customization, redirect, and and laid back news. There we go. All right, everybody, I'm going to shut this stream down now. I will see you on Monday for Maritime Monday. Tuesday, we're going to go over the uh, the UFO congressional hearings that took place last Wednesday that I couldn't cover because I was on the business trial. And then I'm going to Anime Matsuri. I'm going on vacation for two weeks, and I'll do as much as I can during those two weeks. But do not forget Maritime Monday and UFO Tuesday. We'll see you there. Everybody, thank you so much for being Love and respect to all. Larax out. Bye.